Good day and welcome everyone. I'm Tanya Winders, the president of the Global Allergy and Airways Patient Platform. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the beautiful city of Hamburg, Germany. And for those that are joining us online via Zoom. Uh, apologies for the delayed start here, just a few minutes behind due to our lunch on site. But we are so very excited to spend the afternoon with you and providing a scientific update in atopic and airways diseases from global experts from around the world. Now, for those of you who are not in the room with us, we have individuals from uh, the United States, from uh, South America, Central America, Northern Europe, Southern Europe, uh, Asia Pacific, India, Africa, we have a host of individuals around the room and, and so very grateful for everyone making the journey to join us today, whether you're here in person or online. It's going to be a action-packed few hours of the latest science in airways and atopic disease. And since we are getting a bit of a delayed start, I'm going to dive right into our very first presentation. You see our agenda for our time together. Again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, we will cover off on unmet needs in urticaria by Dr. Jonathan Bernstein. Then we'll turn the focus to food allergy and holistic approaches by Dr. Doug Jones. We'll then turn to what's new in atopic dermatitis by Dr. Doug, uh, Brad Glick before coming into a coffee break, which we may try to cut just a tad bit short in order to buy back some time, before wrapping up the rest of our day with environmental influences in allergy and airways disease, and finally, asthma and COPD, new horizons and new hope as we look to the future of what is coming in our field. And so without further ado, let's move to our very first presentation, which is Unmet Needs in Urticaria by Dr. Jonathan Bernstein. Dr. Bernstein is a professor of clinical medicine in the Department of Internal Medicine and Department of Rheumatology, Allergy, and Immunology at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center and is a partner of the Bernstein Allergy Group and Clinical Research Center in Cincinnati. He received his MD from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine and his residency in internal medicine at Cleveland Clinic Hospital in, North, in his allergy immunology training at Northwestern University. He has a spectrum of interest in uh, the, the atopic and airways disease space, but most notably chronic urticaria, angioedema, atopic dermatitis, mast cell disease, chronic cough, asthma, and rhinositis. He is the president-elect of the Quad AI and a member of the Quad AI Foundation, serves on a number of peer-reviewed task force and uh, publications, and so we are so honored to have Dr. Bernstein presenting for us this afternoon. The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Visualizing Progress in the Management of Chronic Spontaneous Urticaria, Harnessing the Clinical Potential of New and Novel Therapies to Address Unmet Patient Needs. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash CJC860. Downloadable additional resources are also available. Hello, this is Dr. Jonathan Bernstein from University of Cincinnati College of Medicine and Bernstein Allergy Group Bernstein Clinical Research Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. Welcome to this unique educational activity focusing on the role of new and novel therapies in the treatment of chronic spontaneous urticaria. Dynamic animations and a video will be used to highlight how elements of type 2 inflammation may play an underlying role in disease pathogenesis and how targeting such components is an attractive therapeutic option. Urticaria is poorly understood and underestimated clinical condition. It's characterized by the sudden onset of itchy wheels and swelling, angioedema, which usually resolves within 24 and 72 hours, respectively. Wheels in patients with urticaria is characterized by central swelling of variable size, almost invariably surrounded by reflex erythema, 
there's an itching and sometimes burning sensation that patients experience, a fleeting nature of the hives. They're evanescent. They come and go with the skin returning to its normal appearance, usually within 30 minutes to 24 hours. In contrast, patients who experience angioedema, who also have urticaria, they have sudden pronounced erythematous or skin-colored swelling of the lower dermis and subcutis or mucous membranes. It sometimes is painful rather than itching. Resolution slower than that of wheels, as angioedema can usually take up to 72 hours to resolve. The classification of urticaria is based on duration and relevance of eliciting factors. Urticaria that lasts six or fewer weeks is considered acute, whereas when it persists for greater than six weeks, it's called chronic. Urticaria should be classified as spontaneous, where there's no specific eliciting factor involved, or inducible, where there's a specific eliciting factor involved. Now, if we look at the burden of chronic spontaneous urticaria, it does pose substantial burden on patients. One can see that patients who have chronic hives have a lot of stress and anxiety associated with this. One day they're fine, the next day they've got welts all over their body and they're very worried and anxious about what might be causing it. And this can lead to depression, social isolation, sleep disturbances, embarrassment when they go into public settings, and difficulty with activities of daily living, such as work and school impairment. Now, chronic spontaneous urticaria can be associated with other clinical symptoms, including joint pain, headache and fatigue, flushing, breathlessness, gastrointestinal symptoms, and palpitations. At any given time, up to 1% of the world's population is affected by chronic urticaria, and up to two-thirds have chronic spontaneous urticaria. Of note, women are twice as likely as men to have chronic spontaneous urticaria. People with chronic spontaneous urticaria who develop swelling tend to experience longer-lasting symptoms. Similarly, patients who have inducible components, as we saw previously, also have a protracted course. However, in most cases, chronic spontaneous urticaria generally lasts one to five years, but can last for decades. Now, this is a nice illustration of the seven C's associated with the chronic spontaneous urticaria diagnostic workup and what you should do in every chronic spontaneous urticaria patients. So initially, one should confirm the diagnosis by ruling out other causes, establish a nice differential diagnosis as we do with any clinical condition. We try to find the cause, look for indicators of chronic spontaneous urticaria as their associations with medications, foods, underlying medical conditions such as thyroid disease, chronic infections, autoimmune disorders. Are there inducible triggers, cofactors that can aggravate or cause hives? Are there comorbidities? And one should check for, again, autoimmunity, but also inducible forms of hives, as we mentioned. And are there other underlying mental health issues? Consequences. What are the consequences? We need to identify problems that are affected by the hives, such as sleep issues, just stress in general, sexual health, as well as work and social performance and then identify the components, assess potential biomarkers or predictors of treatment response. And finally, the course. We should monitor chronic spontaneous activity and try to determine the impact therapies having on the condition and is it well controlled. So this is the confirm. Again, you can see there's a number of things that one should look for and may require additional specialized testing, including a skin biopsy, assessing for other parameters such as complement. We mentioned chronic inducible urticaria, and this can be confirmed with provocation testing with respective triggers such as cold or friction or exercise. And in patients with angioedema only, one should rule out drug-induced forms such as ACE inhibitors. Is there evidence of hereditary angioedema or acquired angioedema, or is it just idiopathic angioedema of unknown cause? So a thorough medical history should be included in the patient's assessment. CSU should be confirmed in all patients by going through a thorough differential diagnosis. And it really only requires limited diagnostic testing initially. We recommend at most initially CBC with differential, a sedimentation rate and a C-reactive protein, sometimes a thyroid test if it's not been done. 
Further testing, however, should be based on aspects of the patient's history and also details that are illustrated in this table. So the next of the C's is cause. And again, the recommendation is that physicians should explore patients with chronic spontaneous urticaria for underlying causes by asking relevant questions and by the use of more specific tests where indicated and available. Specialists should also measure total IgE and IgG antithyroid peroxidase antibodies. And if available, use basophil testing to assess patients with CSU for type 1 and type 2B immunity. So what we're trying to understand is, does the patient have the type of hives that will respond to antihistamines, the type of hives that will respond to certain biologics that are approved for urticaria, and this will help tailor their therapy moving forward. Cofactors is a third of the seven Cs, and this requires a search for relevant conditions that modify disease activity. And this may be related to things like food or drug intolerance, stress, or chronic infections. Many times patients come in thinking there's an association with foods, and however, when they eliminate these foods, they continue to have hives. There is some literature that indicates that certain chemicals in foods could be triggering hives. However, this is very controversial, and there haven't been any well-controlled clinical trials to demonstrate that this is necessarily effective. In terms of drug intolerance, many times patients make associations with medications that they take on a routine basis, like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and it's important that we don't make a casual association because these are important medications, and not all patients who have hives have reactions to these therapies. With respect to stress, you know, there is a need to make sure that patients are not having increased stress, anxiety, depression, or sleep impairment. If so, one can refer the patients to a psychologist or psychiatrist for further assessment. I mentioned chronic infections, and certainly there have been some associations, but these are not strong associations with chronic urticaria. So in general, no routine testing for conditions that modify disease activity should be performed, and further diagnostic tests listed in the above table should only be considered based on the answers to the respective questions in the table. So the next two Cs are comorbidities and consequences. And again, looking for other underlying disorders such as thyroid disease, uh, I mentioned mental disorders and other inducible forms of hives that can be tested by provocation to rule in or rule out chronic inducible urticaria. However, again, Similar to the previous slides, no routine testing should be performed for possible comorbidities and consequences, and the criteria for patients with CSU that should receive further tests are listed in the table. So it's also important to assess components of chronic spontaneous urticaria that are associated with longer disease duration, higher disease activity, and response to treatment. And these are listed here, and you can see that the parameters or biomarkers are linked to higher chronic spontaneous urticaria activity include prothrombin fragments, D-dimer, C-reactive protein, mean platelet volume, and IL-6 the presence of an autoantibody directed against the high affinity Ig receptor on mast cells and basophils, a high D-dimer, a high urticaria activity score, and a high C-reactive protein, previous corticosteroid treatment, and also low blood eosinophil and basophil counts have all been associated with poor response to second-generation antihistamines. In contrast, biomarkers linked to poor response to omalizumab treatment include low total IgE, a positive basophil histamine releasing assay, history of previous immunosuppressive treatments, and low basophil high affinity IgE receptor expression. And then finally, those patients with the biomarkers that actually predict a good response to cyclosporin would be a low total Ig and a positive basophil histamine releasing assay. So I think it's important to assess CSU activity and concomitant chronic inducible urticaria in all patients with chronic spontaneous urticaria and getting CRPs and CBCs with differential should be performed as recommended by the international guidelines, as well as D-dimer and total IG as they might be helpful in guiding the treatment of these patients in respect to disease duration and treatment response. 
Now, this is a recommended diagnostic algorithm for chronic urticaria, and you can see it's broken down by wheels, which are the hives, and angioedema, which is the swelling. And they go through this algorithm. For instance, if we look at wheels, is there a recurrent unexplained fever, joint bone pain, malaise? If it's no, then is there an average wheel duration of greater than 24 hours? Is it no, then are the symptoms inducible? And if it's yes, then one should do the provocation test to try to bring out these types of highs. If it's no, then one can surmise this is likely chronic spontaneous urticaria. But if the wheels are longer than 24, we want to consider other things such as vasculitis, and that may require a biopsy. If it's positive, then that would support the diagnosis. If it's not, then we go back and ask again, are they inducible? And if they're not, then that probably would make this a diagnosis of chronic spontaneous urticaria. There are other conditions that are not something we're going to cover, such as the autoinflammatory diseases or the hereditary acquired angioedema. But this is a very nice algorithm that kind of takes you through the gamut. Now, there are several validated instruments that help the clinician to assess disease activity and the impact and control of the condition. And one is the urticaria activity score. And this is a total of a 42-point score. It's made up of scoring of wheels and itch every day. So there's a maximum of six points per day, going from no wheels or itch to mild to moderate and intense. And these are based on quantifying the number of wheels. So less than 20 for 24 hours is mild, 20 to 50 is moderate, and greater than 50 is intense. Similarly, with the itch, mild is present but not annoying or troublesome, moderate is troublesome but does not interfere with normal daily activity or sleep. And intense is severe pruritus, which is sufficiently troublesome to interfere with normal daily activity and sleep. When you add these up, you get a daily urticaria activity score, and then you get an urticaria activity score over seven days. So the lowest number would be zero, and the highest number would be 42. So now we're going to look at the latest evidence for treatment options related to chronic spontaneous urticaria. What are the basic considerations in the management of chronic spontaneous urticaria? Well, the goal of treatment is to treat into chronic spontaneous urticaria is gone, okay? The therapeutic approach involves the identification and elimination of underlying causes, the avoidance of eliciting factors, and inducing tolerance, if possible, and the use of pharmacologic treatment to prevent mast cell media release or the effects of mast cell mediators. So when we look at identification, elimination of underlying causes, as we discussed earlier, we think about drugs, physical stimuli, infectious agents, treatment of other inflammatory processes, reducing physical and emotional stress and reducing the functional autoantibodies that could be activating mast cells and finally dietary management. You want to treat as much as needed, and as little as possible. Stepping up or stepping down should be done according to the patient's course of disease. And this is a nice algorithm for treatment. And you can see that it starts off by recommending just a single dose of a second generation H1 antihistamine. And if there's inadequate control after two to four weeks or earlier, or if the symptoms are intolerable, then one should advance to up to four times the dose, the recommended dose of second generation antihistamines, which is safe to take. And again, if symptoms are still intolerable, then we have to think about next steps. And one of the higher profile therapies at this point would be omalizumab, which blocks Ig receptors and blocks IgE in the peripheral blood. But if again, if this is ineffective after four to six injections, or if symptoms are intolerable, then we have to potentially think about cyclosporin and we have to make sure that patients don't have underlying medical conditions that make this a relative contraindicated therapy. Up to 50% of patients living with CSU, their disease remains uncontrolled, and available treatment options are few. Thus, additional safe and effective alternative therapeutic options are needed. Now, what are the what are the causes of chronic spontaneous urticaria? Well, we certainly don't know for sure, but there are theories of pathogenesis. Chronic spontaneous urticaria, or CSU, is a mast cell-driven skin disease characterized by the recurrence of transient wheels also referred to as hives, angioedema, or both for more than six weeks. Several mechanisms have been investigated as possibly contributing to the pathogenesis of CSU, including infections, food intolerance, coagulation cascade, genetic factors, and autoimmunity. In type 1 autoimmune CSU, 
IgE autoantibodies to autoantigens, such as thyroid peroxidase and interleukin-24, activate mast cells to secrete vasoactive mediators, cytokines, and chemokines. These, in turn, activate endothelial cells, increase vascular permeability, and promote the migration of blood cells to the dermis. In type 2B and 3 autoimmune CSU, IgG autoantibodies to the IgE receptor, or IgE itself, activate mast cells with the same consequences. Two IgG molecules in proximity activate complement, type 3, to liberate C5A, which augments mast cell secretion and is a separate chemotactic factor for granulocytes and monocytes. The rationale for the development of new agents to be tested for putative efficacy in CSU is dependent on assumptions about which of the aforementioned contributions to hive formation can be inhibited to significantly suppress symptoms. New biologics that are currently under development for the treatment of patients with chronic urticaria aim to reduce mast cell activation by blocking activating pathways or engaging inhibitory receptors or mast cell numbers. Legalizumab, currently being evaluated in phase 3 studies of adults and adolescents with CSU, and GI301 are novel anti-IgE biologics. Avdorolumab and tezepelumab inhibit the effects of C5A and thymixtromal lymphopoietin, respectively. AK002 and the anti-CD200 receptor monoclonal antibody LY345473A trigger inhibitory receptors, and the anti-KIT monoclonal antibody CDX0159 aims to reduce mast cell numbers. Biologics that are currently approved for other conditions are also being evaluated for the treatment of chronic spontaneous urticaria. Dupilumab is a fully human monoclonal antibody that inhibits the signaling of the IL-4 and IL-13 pathways. IL-4 and IL-13 are key and central drivers of the type 2 inflammation that plays a major role in asthma, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis, atopic dermatitis, and eosinophilic esophagitis, and may contribute to CSU. Notably, it was recently reported that a pivotal phase 3 trial met its primary endpoints and all key secondary endpoints at 24 weeks, showing dupilumab nearly doubled reduction in itch and urticaria activity scores in patients with CSU. IL-5 may contribute to the pathogenesis of chronic spontaneous urticaria by direct effects on skin mast cells and by promoting the recruitment of eosinophils and basophils to skin sites of wheel development. Eosinophils and basophils are elevated in the lesional skin of patients with CSU, where they bidirectionally interact with mast cells. Furthermore, high disease activity in CSU is linked to eosinopenia and basopenia. Benralizumab an anti-IL-5 receptor antibody and the anti-IL-5 antibodies mepolizumab and reslizumab are licensed and used for the treatment of patients with asthma. IL-17 is associated with many autoimmune disorders and blood levels of IL-17 in patients with CSU have recently been reported to be elevated and linked to high disease activity. Moreover, the expression of IL-17 was found to be upregulated in the skin of patients with chronic spontaneous urticaria in a recent study, the anti-IL-17 monoclonal antibody secukinumab reduced disease activity in patients with CSU who were refractory to other treatments. The development and launch of novel agents for chronic spontaneous urticaria are encouraging for patients unresponsive to current treatments. As newer biological agents become available, clinicians need to understand both the target and therapeutic mechanism in order to better select appropriate patients for these therapies. Now, this is the approved off-label and novel biologics for chronic urticaria, and we've talked about several of these that are currently undergoing clinical trials, including dupilumab, benralizumab, legalizumab, and also the CDX0159. So there's a number of active trials and with some data to support that they're safe and effective, but we have to wait to see what the phase three trials show and before they, they can be recommendations. A case study reported the benefit of dupilumab treatment in six patients with chronic spontaneous urticaria who had failed to respond to omalizumab. And these are the illustrations of these cases. So there was a significant reduction in hives and so forth. 
This is just looking at the phase three study design and the endpoints, which are primary itch severity score and the urticaria activity score is a secondary endpoint, as is the itch severity index, the high severity index, and angioedema activity score, as well as the urticaria control test and quality of life form, as well as the patient global assessment and percentage of patients receiving oral corticosteroids. Now, again, looking at the results of the CUPID study, this was a trial that enrolled 138 patients. So the primary endpoint in this study in the United States, which was secondary endpoint in the European Union, was the reduction in itch severity with dupilumab. And it was identified that it provided continuous improvement out to week 24. When dupilumab was added, there was a 63% reduction in itch severity with dupilumab and a 35% reduction with standard of care antihistamines. And this is measured by a 0 to 21 point scale, which has been validated in other studies. This equates to a 10.24 point reduction with dupilumab and a 6 point reduction with standard of care. Now, furthermore, there was a 65% reduction in urticaria activity severity with dupilumab versus 37% with standard of care as measured by the 42-point urticaria activity scale. And again, this equates to a 20.53-point reduction with dupilumab and a 12-point reduction with standard of care. The trial also demonstrated safety results similar to the known safety profile of dupilumab for its approved indications for the 24-week treatment period. The occurrence of treatment emergent adverse events were generally similar between the dupilumab and placebo group. The most common adverse events were injection site reactions, and 11% of these occurred with patients taking dupilumab and 13% of patients on placebo. Now, ligalizumab is a next-generation hyphen dehumanized monoclonal anti-IG antibody. So here we see illustration of how ligalizumab binds to Ig in the peripheral blood, so Ig cannot bind to the hyphen the Ig receptor on mast cells, and therefore it can't release the mediators that lead the hives. Now, this is looking at the trial design for ligalizumab for CSU in the phase 2B study, which compares different dosings of ligalizumab to omalizumab, the approved dose, which is 300 milligrams every four weeks versus placebo. And there are three dose ranging groups for ligalizumab. One is 24 milligrams every four weeks, one 72 milligrams every four weeks, and one 240 milligrams every four weeks. It's interesting, the patients who are in one of the placebo groups, they initially get the ligalizumab dose and then thereafter get nothing and are monitored throughout the rest of the study. And you can see in the dose response curve for ligalizumab, it's quite more pronounced compared to omalizumab. So the active comparator is the vertical line and you can see that ligalizumab does improve more significantly in terms of its dose response curve compared to omalizumab. Now, this is looking at the phase 2B trial data for ligalizumab for chronic spontaneous urticaria at week 12. And you can see, looking at weekly itch hive severity based on different dosings, it'll vary. And then similarly, as we see the odds ratios on the right, which indicates that some of these doses are more effective than others. Ligalizumab compared with omalizumab is being investigated in ongoing phase three clinical trial programs to assess its place in the treatment of chronic spontaneous urticaria. Now, benralizumab is an IL-5 receptor alpha-directed cytolytic monoclonal antibody. And this is data from our study that shows that patients who were receiving benralizumab had a run-in period of a placebo, and then they received their first dose, and there was improvement in their UAS7 scores as well as their individual markers and components. And then it starts to plateau and then further decline over the final you know, four to six weeks. So again, this is one of the studies that led to the initiative to conduct the Arroyo study, which is ongoing. So these are some final thoughts about how novel treatment options for chronic spontaneous urticaria have the potential to transform the management of this disease. Well, I think it's important to recognize that only up to 40 to 50% of patients with chronic hives respond to high-dose antihistamines. And so we need other treatment options. And the role of biologics have really opened up the field of urticaria and provided some additional treatment options and have actually improved their hives remarkably. 
So I think that with more of these therapies, more understanding of relevant biomarkers, which features in a patient would be most suitable for receiving one or other agents has really created a whole new understanding of this oftentimes difficult to treat disease. That ends our discussion for today. I hope you found the activity informative and useful to your practice and encourage you to access the supplemental materials. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bernstein. Um, and such a great overview. And I know that in the room, we've got several organizations that work in the space of chronic urticaria under your missions and remit as we do online. And I, I just want to give a, a significant shout out to Elaine Drury, who is from Canada and um, is a very active member of our chronic urticaria coffee chat community and leads so much of the work with the UCARE and Galen expert networks in bringing the patient voice forward in chronic urticaria. There's so much hope in this space, and GAP has done such a, 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 an amount of work uh, specifically in helping to design these clinical trials in recruiting and retention in these clinical trials and in disseminating the information that comes from these studies. And so a, a therapeutic area, disease area, that perhaps even three, four, or five years ago, there was very little hope for patients. Um, you can see today there's great hope on the horizon. So now we're going to turn to yet another disease area that I know many of our members have great interest in, and I do as well very personally, and that is food allergy. And it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Douglas Jones to the stand. Uh, Dr. Jones is going to be bringing his expertise and providing his uh, perspective on holistic approaches to food allergy. Um, he's board certified by the American Board of Allergy and Immunology. He attended the University of Utah, where he received his bachelor's degree in biology, and then his medical degree from Penn State University College of Medicine. From there, all, following on to med school, he completed a residency program in internal medicine and subspecialty training in allergy, asthma, and immunology at Creighton University. He's a co-founder and current president of a nonprofit organization, the Food Allergy Support Team, FAST. And Dr. Jones is an established leader in the treatment of food allergies. More importantly, I think for me, is knowing Dr. Jones and working with him for now quite some time, is that he does look at the whole person. He takes a holistic approach, and he does not believe in a one-size-fits-all approach to food allergy. And so taking that individual patient before him, a caregiver, and entering into shared decision-making, as I know that you'll hear from him throughout his talk. So welcome, Dr. Jones. Thank you. To, to get started, I have a question for you. So how many of you here either have a sibling or have more than one child? Raise your hand. Either a sibling or more than one child. So most, most people in the room. OK, so I want you to think, just kind of in the back of your minds, I want you to think about uh, either your sibling or if you have children, kind of the the differences, the similarities, what makes each unique, good, bad, or ugly, uh, between those individuals. I'm going to get to that towards the end of the presentation, but I just want to set the stage with that. Um, objectives today, we're going to identify some barriers in treating food allergy. We'll re review some research. And then I'm also going to talk about a holistic approach to patients with adverse food reactions. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about my why. Why am I here? Tanya just read kind of the whole you know, list of uh, my biography and all of that, but th that's okay. But what really drives me to be here? Let me tell you a story. Shortly after I was done with my training, uh, that was about 15 years ago, and the landscape of food allergy was much different than what it is now. So as time went on, I started seeing more and more food allergy patients and also kind of realizing I didn't know what to do with them. And I was treating a particular family. Uh, the, the older son had peanut and tree nut allergies. And then the mom brought in the younger daughter, 11 months old, she was kind of distraught, and she said, I think she has a milk allergy. You know, she had a, a drop of milk spill. She'd got hives all over. And she said, please just tell me 
it's just milk because we already have peanut, tree nut avoidance in our home, and I'm struggling with knowing how to add milk and dairy to, to the mix. Long story short, as we kind of work through things, the daughter had milk, eggs, wheat, peanut, and tree nuts. And as I'm delivering the news to that mom, there were several things that happened in that experience that changed the course of me and why I do what I do. First of all, the mom looks at me and says, with tears in her eyes, what do I feed my child? And I said, I have no idea. And I, I was just sick to my stomach for her. And the other thing that it kind of taught me in that moment was there such a difference between a doctor giving news to a patient about allergies and the patient receiving the news. As soon as that happened, I mean, as soon as our conversation was done, I had to move on to the next room. But what happened in their life? Every single minute of every single day was just changed. And I started contemplating that, and I was sick because I thought, I did not serve them today. I did not give them an answer that I was happy with and satisfied with. And I thought, something has to change. And so, r really quickly, when I was training, a doctor that, that trained me, who's near and dear to me, was like a second dad. We did a lot of drug desensitizations in, in our clinic, and so many times in the training, he would bring us uh, a patient, and he would say, we need to desensitize them to this drug. I want you to look up all the research and the protocols on this drug. So we'd do, you know, do all the research, and guess what? We wouldn't find anything. We go back and say, there is no protocol for this. And you say, you're right, there is none. But do you know what you have? You have a brain, and you can think, and you can apply science, because we're allergists, and we desensitize. That's what we do. And so he would say, create the protocol based off science. And so this is how I was trained. And in that moment, when I'm thinking about these, these, this patient and the children and my desperation, of wanting to do something different, I thought of that and I thought, use your brain, apply some science. This is what we do. There has to be a better answer here and I have to be able to give a better hope to so many people who have been unheard. They need to be heard and I need to make a bigger impact and bring choices to people and dispel some myths and fear through education. That's why I'm here today, for those people for that family or any person or family that's in that situation. That's why I'm here. The problem, as you all know, food allergy is expanding leaps and bounds. Numbers are increasing, the costs are increasing, children are being bullied, there are nutrition and calorie deficits, and honestly, it's not even a child's problem anymore. This is also an adult problem. There's many adults, one in 10 now, that are getting food allergy. And more than double that think they have food allergy because of all the misinformation that kind of surrounds that. What are some barriers? There's lack of resources, proper testing. And when I say proper testing as a barrier, not only are some tests not available, but even validated tests are not great. You know, we can do better and, and more tests are being developed. Um, there's a lack in good testing. There's, there's a lack of ability in some clinics to do food challenges or treatment. In some countries, there's not even an availability of epinephrine. There's a lack of education. There's healthcare fragmentation. When I say fragmentation, I mean not only does everyone kind of stay in their lane, but they even stay in their lane in their approach to a person. You know, it, it's, this is my specialty and I'm only focusing on this and I, even though you're a person, this is all I'm doing, right? There's fragmentation, there's not good communication. And there's also a lot of misunderstanding surrounding food allergy. Why is there misunderstanding? If you look at this diagram here, adverse food reactions. There's a whole list, it's, it's all down there. And there's an oversimplification because what happens in the world, if anyone has any kind of adverse, adverse food reaction, guess what, they get labeled food allergy. Well, that's like if somebody has dementia, stroke, 
and seizures, we all just decide to label them as strokes. Well, that's inappropriate. And, and it does those with seizures and dementia disservice. Well, as we label everyone with a food allergy that's on this table, if we all label them one thing, we're doing them a disservice. And so we, ha we can't oversimplify it. And as advocates, we have to get clarity. We have to demand better. There's also an overemphasis of non-validated tests uh, because people are making a lot of money off non-validated tests, and so it blurs the lines. And there's so much more with how food interacts with a person uh, <clears throat> in, than the context of that individual in their circumstances and time. So we need to be clear in diagnostics and clear in terms of where people fall. Some of the remarks that I'm going to give today will center a little bit or be more slanted towards IgE-mediated food allergy because that's a bulk of patients of what you know, I've seen, but also the concepts that I'm gonna talk about can apply in the various groups. When I think about food allergy families, a lot of times I think about a life full of can'ts. I can't eat this food. I can't go to this restaurant. I can't go to this friend's house. I can't go to this ball game. I can't do all of these things. What can we do? I, I kind of like to shift that dynamic and that mindset of what can we do? We can do a lot. We can ensure better diagnoses and have clarity. We can go for reliable resources. I always tell people, be prepared, not scared. We can be prepared. We can help, we can network, we can support each other, we can have more compassion and understanding and less judgment. And we can also seek better treatments. We could command better from professionals, me included. Um, and there's so many treatments that are available now that we can do. What can we offer? There's prevention measures at our fingertips. These prevention measures have been at our fingertips for eight years years. How well have they been implemented by pediatricians and allergists across the world? Not much. They have been at our fingertips. Well, let's start utilizing some of those tools that are at our fingertips with prevention. There's also oral immunotherapy with biologics or without. I don't care. I've done all of it. Sublingual immunotherapy, the same. This little guy, here's my first oral immunotherapy patient. June 20th, 2013, coming up on the 10-year anniversary. And 10 years later, I will say he's living a full life. He, he's doing so well and thriving. And it's so much more. So many times when you read literature on immunotherapy, they focus on you know, how many reactions and how many EpiPens and how many this and how many that. It's so much more than that. Getting food safely into the diet is one thing, but the mental, emotional shift that psychosocial shift is really what changes the quality of life. Um, as you look at, obviously this is a busy slide, it's more for reference, but it just shows kind of the varying approaches to management of IgE-mediated food allergy across the world. And you have all the countries here, in Australia, United States, Canada, Italy, and, and you have this column of, is Palforzi approved or not, or is, or, are they using OIT with commercially available products? And what other treatments are available? I kind of look at this and I, I, I was thinking, maybe it's because I'm in Germany, I was thinking of cars. And I'm like, it's almost like every country, you know, you have your German cars, you have your Japanese cars, you have your Korean cars and, and American cars. And everyone's trying to kind of get their car. And the, the point is though, every car gets you from point A to B. Everything on here is getting people from point A to B. Now, there are certain safety measures, um, efficiency. There's certain things that can make the ride more comfortable for the driver and the passengers. Not just the driver, but also the passengers. So there's different things, and we're all kind of striving to improve the safety, efficiency, and experience of the person uh, across the world but there's a lot being done. I will tell you, commercially available foods, OIT is growing rapidly. Um, as mentioned, I'm the president of the Food Allergy Support Team, which is a nonprofit group, and we've done annual meetings for the last six, seven years, 
And I will say there has been a distinct change in the last two to three years. OIT isn't emerging, it's emerged, it's here. Uh, and this, this sector is growing. There are publications. I've actually been able to be a part of uh, a couple of pub publications where we're establishing best practices for OIT. There's guidelines on Spanish, European, Canadian. There, there's a food allergy journal. Um, this is separate than, from FAST, but a lot of the members of FAST are contributors to the journal. And just to kind of give you a flavor, this journal, I mean, it covers all aspects. It's setting up a clinic. It's identifying the right patient. It's dis shared decision making. It's identifying risk factors, how to deal with side effects. And it's not just for peanut, because that's the thing that gets all the press, but guess what? We also include milk and eggs and tree nuts and peanuts and and sesame and legumes and, I mean, done shrimp and chicken, take your pick. So it, it really is kind of a, an inclusive approach. There is also an option of Palforzia, which is an FDA-approved pharmaceutical product. Um, it's, a, it's an option, it's a good option. Uh, in my opinion, from what I see, I'm not privy to their numbers. I don't think it's growing as fast because I've kind of seen a contraction of their sales force. It's not necessarily concerning to me. It might be to investors, not necessarily to me. Um, it's still an, it's a good option. Um, there's just some, uh, perhaps some restrictions with it that I think poses some additional challenges that I think they have to navigate. And I'll kind of get to that in a little while. What's in the, what's in the pipeline? So just kind of a summary, you have uh, an anti-peanut specific uh, anti-IgE, IgG antibody, you have a peanut vaccine, you have immunomodulators, you have peptides, you have toothpaste, you have different kinds of patches. Um, most of these are focused on peanut. Great promising products, okay, that are on the horizon. But I'm gonna pose a different question. What kind of answers are these really? I think they have about as much depth as a skin test. They just scratch the surface. They're just scratching the surface. Oh, by the way, it reminds me. Do you know why you really, truly can't trust an allergist? We're just a bunch of backstabbers. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so I started this presentation with my why, okay? And then I presented a problem list. But now I want to take a little closer look at the real problem. We discussed... Allergy statistics, food allergy are going up, but why? Just as I felt it important for you all to understand my why, it is, under, it is important to understand this why. Why are they increasing so much? Let's look beyond the clickbait, look beyond the headlines. What are some causes as to why these things are increasing? In summary, there's a lot of different theories. Some leading theories here are disruption of the microbiome in the skin, gut, and lungs. Sometimes when you think about microbiome, you're just talking about the gut. Well, we tend to forget there's also microbiome in the lungs and the, and the skin. And including with those disruptions would be the hygiene hypothesis, an increase in C-sections, antibiotics, antacids, stress, 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 okay, anxiety, diet, these are all kinds of disruptors of the microbiome, which, what does that do? Leads to inflammation. And that inflammation is going to uh, unsettle our homeostasis, which is uh, I'm going to get to in a minute. Vitamin D deficiency. By the way, in the chronic spon spontaneous urticaria, uh, you want to do your, those patients a favor, check their vitamin D. Get it, get it above 45 nanograms per milliliter, and that little pearl will save you thousands of dollars. Um, genetics, and then also kind of years of bad recommendations by governing societies are also kind of a cause of food allergy. Take LEAP, for instance. We told people to avoid all these foods for so long that it kind of set in motion a different dynamic. I'm going to talk just a minute about an 80-20 principle, which I think many of you have heard, but I want to set the stage for this because it's going to launch into the last part of my presentation. 
So many of you know there are certain things in life where you can put in 20% of the effort and get 80% of the outcome. There's also some things that take 80% effort and you get 20% outcome. I think, my opinion, when we focus treatments or solutions, think about your groups, by the way. This, this, this can be applied to not just medicine, but anything. Whenever my staff come to me with like a staff problem, most of the time their solution is treating the effect of the problem. And I redirect them and say, okay, let, that's great, I appreciate the effort, that's a good start, but let's take it a few steps back and really get to the heart of the issue, the cause, right? I think when you address a cause, you get in that 20 to 80 uh, window. When you focus on effects, it's more the 80-20. Let me demonstrate. Let's revisit the treatment options that are available. Okay, we've already discussed them. I'm not gonna review those. That's what's available. I'm going to ask you, what do they address? Effects or causes? Now you still get output when you address an effect, right? But how efficient is it? How safe is it? None of these address what we just discussed with the causes. None. There is a disconnect. There is fragmentation. Like I mentioned before, there's fragmentation. Well, let's say, for instance, we're doing OIT, which I've done for you know, 10 years. We've treated over 2,500 patients now. Um, when you do OIT, if I just stayed in that lane, we'd get a good effect, which we have. But as I have widened the view to address more of the food allergy causes, like the real causes, guess what? We're getting greater output, much greater output with less effort. And so I'm going to propose something where we take our thought process from fragmentation to integration. Food integration into a body is an orchestrated event. If we are only focusing on effects, it's like we're only hearing the string section of an orchestra. We need to broaden the view and, and our hearing a little bit more to incorporate the percussion, to incorporate the brass section. And this engages not just the immune system, but it engages many systems, including barriers, the digestive system, immune system, nervous system, endocrine system. We have to consider these things. This is a person. This is the context of a person. Let's take, for instance, the concept of neuroinflammation, which I want to uh, introduce today. There is a bi-directional relationship between the immune system and the central nervous system. It's also in the context of the endocrine system. Immune system regulates the CNS. CNS drives immunity. They act reciprocally, again, in the C of the endocrine, right? These systems have, they share receptors, cytokines, neurotransmitters, hormones, neuropeptides, and so many of these molecules that we thought were in one system only, guess what, as we broaden our mind, um, we're realizing they share, you know, something that's, for instance, cytokines, immune, is synthesized in the CNS. You have hormones that are also produced by immune cells. See the interaction? It's bi-directional. And this also culminates in allergic inflammation. Neural pathways mediating this interaction are mainly via the autonomic nervous system, the vagal nerve, sympathetic nerve fibers, sending signals to and from this dynamic. Apart from systemic effects, there's various immune cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, mast cells, innate lymphoid cells, all of these have a bi-directional relationship with our nervous system. And it has a potent effect on tissue homeostasis and inflammation, in particular, Th2 inflammation. There's um, neuronal regulation of something called uh, group two and eight lymphoid cells play an important role in Th2 inflammation in the context of allergies. These ILC2s produce IL-5, IL-13, Right? These are all Th2 cytokines. Um, and there's this neuronal regulation of it. If you look 
And this is not just for food allergy, by the way. This can be applied to asthma as well. You've got the lungs, the intestines. This is just a diagram where you see the proximity of nerve endings, nerve fibers, in proximity with, say, eosinophils, mast cells, the lymphoid cells, as I talked about. Again, this is all still in the context of the, um, the endocrine system. So what if there's trauma or injury? Have you heard of the concept of nociception? Is that some? So when you're, when you're walking down a path, and are you thinking about all the time where your foot placement is as you go up and down a curb? No. A lot of that's done automatically. Usually as you're walking, uh, your foot placement in, in that space and time is done auto automatically, and that's called nociception. When you sprain your ankle, for instance, um, that nociception gets altered. So now the signals aren't quite intact and you're more prone to sprain it again because you're not sensing quite right that, that position of your foot in space and time. Well, neuroception is a similar concept where if you are emotionally traumatized, for instance, like food allergy, which you get PTSD from, if you're emotionally traumatized and that isn't healed, guess what? That sensory system gets off. And so something that perhaps wouldn't be noxious or threatening in a normal situation now becomes that because those emotional sensors are off. I'm not going to go through all of this for the sake of time, but think about why are serum IgE levels so poor at predicting severity of reaction? Actually, they don't predict severity of reaction. Why? Why don't they predict the amount of food that, that it takes to elicit a reaction? Because it's only taking one thing into account. It's one thing in the context of a person. You know, when somebody consumes a food, it is in the context of what's happening with their nervous system, their inflammation, their endocrine system, what time of day it is, for females, what time of month it is, the whole thing. It all plays a role. So some holistic considerations are, what's the quality of food that somebody's taking in? What is the context of the person as that food is interacting with the uh, as the food is interacting with the person, what's their past traumas been? What's contributing to their microbiome? What disruptions have been there? What's the context of their hormones? All of those things can be taken into account as we do, for instance, OIT or SLIT, or even perhaps one of the newer products that are gonna potentially get FDA approval at some point. I'm not saying don't do those. I'm saying do both. Do those in the context of this. In my opinion, it's about meeting people where they are and then guiding them to where they want to be. We, we have this situation where um, we often focus solely on the acute life-threatening situation. But as my good friend Fallon, I gotta give her credit for, for the concept on this, and many of you know her. Uh, she often says, you know, food allergy is like a, it's a chronic social it's a social uh, situation um, where it's more about the quality of life, and I, and I have to agree with that. These effects are acute and chronic in a bi-directional relationship as well. And it also influences, um, it also influences treatment. I kind of like to think so many times, if you're reading the literature about food allergy, it's all about standardization of product and protocol. I am so fatigued of that. I'm just going to be honest. Um, I like to put people over product and protocol. There's a reason that slide looks like that. It's people over product and protocol. I'm going to give you an example. This is where my initial question comes into play. Okay? So if you have had siblings or multiple children, uh, I have both. I have a lot of siblings, and I have four daughters, who are all once teenagers at one time. Um, a, a few years ago, I went to my children and I said, you know what, 
And, and I also grew up in a house where it was rules, 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 rules. Standardization, standardization. My home was like a product and a protocol. It was standardized, rigid, right? That's the home I grew up in. And I went to my kids and I said, I don't want that. So we're ditching that. And I said, we together are going to create some values. I'm, both of us. We're creating these. And I said, I want these values to be that guide to take you from where you are to where you want to be. And we're going to work on this together because this journey is together. And so this is what they came up with. We came up with. When I'm doing oral immunotherapy, I actually think about this. Why? Because when you're doing immunotherapy, for instance, there's a definite wrong way to go about it. There's a definite dangerous way of going about it. And part of my passion and what I'm doing in a lot of the education is to teach people how to not do it wrong, but to kind of stay within values, staying within a guide, adhering to this, but at the same time, meeting each person where they are. If I treated every single solitary one of my children the same, identical, and tried to fit them into a standardized protocol, I would not be successful. And too many times in medicine, I believe, we are trying to fit people, individuals, into a product and protocol. I think we need to establish safe values, safe parameters, that's gonna get us from A to B, but fit that into the context of the person. That, to me, is a holistic approach and can be done safely. I've been doing it now for years with my uh, food allergy patients. We need to shift that focus from effects to causes instead of the standardization to an evidence-based individualization from fragmented care to coordinated and collaborative care centered on a person, not necessarily a diagnosis or a test, but taking all of those things into account, meeting them where they are, guiding them to where they want to be, taking the hand and going together, getting their input, by the way, on those values, if I, the, the deal with my children is I said, if you ever want to do something against the value, come to me, and we're going to talk about it. And we're going to go over what the consequences of that may be. And we're going to decide together what, what may be the best direction to go after we've had you know, a, a good discussion about that. It's the same thing with my patients. You know, when we're looking at treatment, Yes, OITs, their treatment is here, it's available. Um, but there is so much more that we can do no matter what our situation is. And amidst the noise, let's not miss the sweet music of the person. Again, meet them where they are and let's guide them to where they wanna be. And if anyone wants to connect with me, that's how you connect with me. And I appreciate your time, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Um, we are gonna have time for Q&A here at the end of our next session. So save your questions on all things food allergy, urticaria, and next atopic dermatitis. And Dr. Jones is going to field those for us after this next presentation. And so atopic dermatitis is a space, again, that if we look at uh, the evolution over the last five, six years, it is remarkable. I can't tell you how many times I pick up the phone, have a conversation with patients from all over the globe who say, "My, this is mir it's a miracle. My life is completely different than what it what used to be, living with atopic dermatitis. And yet we still know that there's a number of patients who don't have access to those innovative treatments. There's a number of patients who perhaps still are unresponsive to the approved treatments in certain regions of the world. And we got members of our community, of the GAP community online, representing all over the world, um, and also here in the room, who this is your dedicated space. This is the uh, disease area that you spend the majority of your time focusing on skin and that skin matters beyond just skin deep, right? That atopic dermatitis has a significant psychosocial impact 
atop the clinical impact. So today we're gonna hear from Dr. Brad Glick on what is new in atopic dermatitis. Dr. Glick is a board certified dermatologist and he practices in Wellington, Florida. He performs a blend of dermatological, surgical, and aesthetic procedures. He graduated from Emory University uh, and then went on to Emory University School of Public Health. Then he went on to earn his medical degree, uh, his DO degree with honors from Nova Southeastern University and did his internal medicine at South Broward Hospital in Miami and then has moved on to work in the West Palm Beach area. His residency training program, Greater Miami Skin and Laser Center at Mount Sinai and again is a diplomat of the American Osteopathic Board of Dermatology and has served on a number of publications and guidelines committees, uh, written a lot of textbook chapters. And so Dr. Glick is, is a wonderful leader, thought leader in this space of atopic dermatitis. So we'll hear from him next. update we'll talk a little bit about everything um, want to be able to emphasize recognizing the physical and psychosocial burden of moderate severe atopic dermatitis uh, mostly moderate severe atopic dermatitis but really all spectrums of AD we'll discuss evidence-based data and emerging therapies as well as comorbidities um, I'm a big comorbidity person in, in that I think it's so important when we uh, look at therapeutic intervention, and we'll look at implementing individualized treatment strategies for patients with uh, uh, atopic disease and impact as well on those therapies and quality of life. You know, where exactly is the research taking us? Well, in, in my humble view, it's taking us to a better understanding of the you know, the variety of presentations that patients with atopic dermatitis have, their phenotypes, genotypes, the comorbidities, the ever-changing understanding of the immune pathophysiology, particularly where the microbiome is concerned, um, and the innumerable therapeutic options that we're gonna have uh, in our toolbox, and that we now, thankfully, uh, have um, very recently with a whole host of new products. So I was born in 1961, and this is what the understanding of atopic dermatitis was. We have kind of a yin and yang of the psychology of atopic dermatitis, really not a lot talking about the skin barrier, uh, itch scratch cycles, sweat reduction, some contactants, really not a lot. And this comes out of uh, Pillsbury and Shelley's uh, text here. And not moving here, there we go advanced dermatologic therapy. And it's kind of amazing that we've gone and gone from that uh, to, to this, this incredible understanding that we have of you know, some antigenic stimulus leading to the production of innate lymphoid cells, the disrupted skin barrier, the outside in or the inside out hypothesis that we know that Th2 cytokines, Th22 cytokines, even Th17 cytokines play important roles in various populations uh, for atopic dermatitis. So really, really come a very long way. We'll talk about drugs, comorbidities, new strategies, treatment paradigms, and some of the subtypes of atopic dermatitis. And I'm also going to say a couple words uh, about the epidemiology of atopic dermatitis, although it was teed up very nicely by Dr. Friedman yesterday, and so I won't spend a ton, a ton of time on it. But I think the epidemiology of atopic dermatitis is so important important because it really highlights the severity of this disease. And so the question is, am I going to get that done in now 27 minutes and 28 seconds? Um, I don't know. I, I certainly hope so. Um, Kevin over here, well, he doesn't think so, but, but I do, and hopefully I will get through it. I have to have a little bit of comedy in my, my talks. So, um, you know, Dr. Friedman highlighted yesterday the significance, the prevalence of atopic dermatitis. I think the biggest thing is that the number of individuals impacted by this condition is expected to increase precipitously over the next few years, and it's currently over 30 million. So that's really a big number. One in five school-age children, 90% manifest atopic dermatitis within the first year of life. And I think one of the things that, that Dr. Friedman highlighted uh, yesterday is, is about, you know, that 25% of adults that manifest atopic dermatitis, you know, later on in life as their first presentation of atopic dermatitis. Uh, it's a big group with an unmet need. And I think finally on this slide, what I'm stricken by in this great work done by uh, John Silverberg, who's now uh, in Dr. Friedman's department at GW, and that is children with atopic dermatitis may awaken as often as 36 times per night. Um, that's not only not fun for them, but it's, it's not very uh, good for their parents, too. Very challenging. Uh, the so-called co-sleeping effect 
and we can imagine how that might impact behaviors. And, and highlighting it here are just a few of these little pieces of information. This is mostly from Eric Simpson's work uh, out at the Oregon Health Sciences Center. Um, uh, daily itching, 88% uh, uh, of itch in this, in this uh, survey, a, a large population of individuals with atopic dermatitis. Itching that lasts uh, you know, at least 12 hours per day. Some of patients with atopic dermatitis are essentially itching all day. 55% of patients with atopic dermatitis have been itching more or less on a day-to-day -day basis for over 10 years. That itch burden is really a, a very big deal. Dr. Freeman actually highlighted this slide yesterday, and because of that marked pruritus, we know that there are incredibly high rates of depression and anxiety, and I'm going to talk about some evidence-based medicine in a couple of moments that really confirms that. Psychological impact, I just mentioned the sleep disruption, there's significant impact on mental health, and, and this really impacts not only quality of life, but also lost days from work for adults and, and, and for our, our children in school, uh, missing out in school, and that impacts social isolation. In the last three years, with the unmasking of healthcare disparities, we're looking very closely more now at various populations uh, that are impacted by disease states like atopic dermatitis. So this is from some nice collaborative work from Brunner and, uh, and uh, Emma Gutman yasky just published a couple of years ago, and also another study that was done by Wan and colleagues uh, uh, back in 2014 looking at some of the differences that we've been able to learn from stu stu studying the skin of different skin types. And you see the differences here where we see a little bit of less transepidermal water loss in individuals of, of color and black skin. Uh, that same goes for the water content and the, the, the amount of ceramide content in their skin and the reactivity of their skin. Although in, in African Americans, we know they tend to have more of that um, like a knit of this type of appearance, this papular appearance, this follicular or perifollicular appearance of their atopic dermatitis, and we see the differences all the way through the spectrum to Caucasian skin, uh, which we mostly see in our, our, in our clinics depending on where your clinical practice is. And if you look at, at Asian skin, th these individuals have profound atopic dermatitis because of the profound trans epidermal water loss, uh, because of their abnormalities of water content in their skin and also their ceramide levels or absence thereof and their skin reactivity, which is high. And we see some clinical photos here too, the differences from Caucasian skin where we see a little bit uh, more of the classical atopic dermatitis with the headlight sign, almost more a little bit of, of psoriasiform type plaques in the erythema and the scale and the population that we see in atopic dermatitis, where to the right we see an in a, a, an Asian child where we see these more almost polycyclic, whirly-like areas of erythema. Very, very little scale, but you can see the disruption in the skin barrier in this child. And some of the changes that we'll see in individuals of color in these uh, photographs of uh, individuals with, uh, uh, that are African American, we see the profound dispigmentation. And it's not always, as we like to say, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation that we see to the right, but we see that dispigmentation is also profoundly hypopigmented at many times. We see on the wrist, on the, the dorsal hand, the, 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 the dorsal surface of the upper extremity on that picture on the left, the marked lichenification, the increase in these uh, skin surface markings that we see in these patients. This article was really just published within the past month by Andy Alexis, um, who is now uh, at um, uh, Cornell, and um, very nice study that was done looking at the insights of skin of color patients. Uh, they evaluated a whole host of studies, although there are not that many of them uh, evaluating individuals of color, particularly those uh, of African uh, American descent. And what was highlighted in this article is just really the clinical presentations, the differences between skin types that I highlighted already. And really what these authors found is just simply that more studies need to be done. There are just are not a lot of studies that are done with individuals of color. Are our partners in industry are, are trying very hard to uh, capture a number of individuals in clinical trials that are of different skin types, that are people of color, and, and certainly our African American population, where in atopic dermatitis, they represent a big component of those uh, individuals who have atopic dermatitis. Let's focus in on, on some drugs and really going to talk at the end about a few different products that I think are, are important for our toolbox. Some are here, some are coming. Uh, but I, I put this up here because you know, there is just such a plethora of studies that are being done right now for atopic dermatitis. This is a compendium that's out, just published in 2022. It's a global clinical trials review. It's 964 pages. There are over 100 products right now that are being studied for atopic dermatitis. So we 
we really are having not only an evolution of products, but it's really kind of like a revolution. So for this nice work that was done by Munira Campos, uh, basically uh, she looked at the various small molecules, specific targets that are related to the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis. And what we can see that even beyond the products that we have right now, coming to market hopefully to help our patients, particularly those that have this neurogenic itch, and I'll talk about neurogenic itch at the end of the talk, Drugs that are coming, whether they're topical or even oral agents, that impact pruritus, uh, that, that impact the epidermal barrier. I'll highlight one of them, which is, you know, we'll talk about in a couple minutes, which, which is etocamab. We have uh, drugs that in inhibit prostaglandins. We have other topical therapies that are going to be coming that we already know about that actually have been highlighted uh, at this meeting, which is a, an agent like Rifumilas, also to Pinaroff, are also being studied uh, in atopic dermatitis. And so there are a whole host of products that are small molecule agents that are coming to market. Uh, here's one that's called uh, diphelicephalin. I'm actually studying this in a clinical trial right now. Uh, we, we know that the itch burden, that itch scratch cycle, is so profound in patients with atopic dermatitis. So maybe instead of just going after those cytokines that are responsible for the barrier changes that we see in atopic dermatitis, perhaps going after the itch, this particular agent is actually um, a, a kappa res, uh, receptor as opposed to a mu receptor, but a, 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 a kappa um, a neurogenic receptor uh, antagonist. And of course, we have our Janus kinase inhibitors, uh, which have come to market. And, uh, Sandra gave a great talk uh, on hepatocytin just a couple moments ago. Um, biologic agents, there's going to be a number of them coming to market, um, but it's very interesting that they're not just targeted at the inflammatory burden of the disease, but also, as I said just a couple moments ago, uh, the itch, the epithelial barrier. We have an agent, etocamab, which is an interleukin-33 inhibitor, which appears to play a very important role, perhaps, uh, in the restoration of the skin barrier from the inside uh, to the outside. Uh, we have a whole host of, of, of agents that are already available, like tezipezumab, which is approved for treating asthma. This is a thymic strimal lymphopoietin uh, inhibitor, is, like I said, approved in asthma, M may come to market uh, for our, our patients suffering with atopic dermatitis. Uh, we, we know that there's some other interleukin-13 inhibitors that are coming to market, that, uh, and one that is here already. I will highlight that uh, at the end of the talk. So what's approved right now? Uh, we've talked about some of this. Dr. Kursik gave a great talk about the use of ruxolitinib now approved in vitiligo, but we know that it's approved uh, for taking care of our patients with um, mild to moderate atopic dermatitis. Of course, we have our TCIs uh, and pimicrolimus, which is also for mild to moderate disease, and Chris Arboro. Tacrylimus is uh, approved for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, and of course, we have our oral systemics in abracitinib and upatacitinib, uh, injectables, dupilumab and trilokinumab. And so this is what's in our toolbox right now. And if you think about back to just 2015 when dupilumab was approved, we really didn't have anything. And so we really kind of thank uh, uh, Sanofi, Genzyme, Regeneron for bringing this amazing product to market and really revolutionized uh, our uh, ability to be able to take care of our patients with atopic dermatitis. Just a few words about ruxolitinib. You know that it's a JAK-1-2 uh, inhibitor. It's approved for mild to moderate atopic dermatitis. Um, it's interesting that we talked a lot yesterday when Dr. Uh, Kursa gave his talk on Vitiligo, same kind of warnings for infections and mortality, malignancy, mace, you know, that class effect. Yet it's ironic that ruxolitinib, the oral agent, does not have a black box warning. Just want to throw that out there. I really don't know why that is and how that is, but it's a different day and time and it's a different uh, set of class warnings. Um, some JAK inhibitors, oral agents, uh, abracitinib is a JAK1 inhibitor as well. Uh, it's approved for adults uh, 18 years of age or older, uh, can't be used in combination with other immunosuppressive agents. Uh, three dosing regimens, 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams are the primary dosing regimens. 50 milligrams once daily is utilized in an indiv individual with renal impairment. And some of the adverse events, um, some nausea, so it's recommended that taken with food, um, nasopharyngitis, uh, headaches. There are some potential contraindications with antiplatelet therapies, and so you want to stay away from those, perhaps accepting uh, baby aspirin or low-dose aspirin. Um, the, again, the same kind of warnings that we have for the, the classes of JAK inhibitors. I will point out with this uh, drug, not only the uh the dosing adjustment in moderate renal impairment, but also there are some potential um, drug interactions with the CYP2C19 uh, uh, metabolizers. 
Here's some of the clinical trial data. If you look all the way out to the right, there are two replicate trials, true AD, uh, tri true AD, trial AD1 and, and trial AD2. And uh, if you look at the 100 milligram and 200 milligram treatment codes, very nice uh, clinical responses where investigators' global assessments of clear or minimal disease are concerned. Uh, and as well, I, I think more real world for us, and, and um, Sandra pres uh, presented about upatacitinib today, uh, but you know, both of these drugs, abracitinib and upatacitinib, have trials where there is concurrent use of corticosteroids. And I, and I like that, that these trials are occurring now because they make it much more real, real world. And so when we see the use of an agent like a JAK inhibitor used in combination with corticosteroids, as you can see down to the right, those individuals that achieve clear and minimal disease or easy 75 responses, so 75% improvement of that easy score, uh, there are robust responses, so about 47% uh, for IgA and 68% uh, of individuals achieving a very high bar of EZ75. Here's upadacitinib. I'm not going to really talk a lot about it because Sandra did a fantastic job in her talk. Um, I, I will like to highlight a few things, though, that there are multiple approvals for this Janus kinase inhibitors for psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, ulcerative colitis, and ankylosing spondylitis. And there will be another indication um, coming uh, soon for um, non-radiographic um, axial spondylitis. The dosing regimens uh, she went over, and you see some of the uh, very similar class warnings that we have. And this is the clinical trial data, which you really uh, just saw, except perhaps, pray tell, uh, with the real world data that we'll see when it's used in combination with corticosteroids. And we do see um, a dose dependent uh, effect with these Janus kinase inhibitors, and we do see a little bit of a, a safety blip when we go up into the higher doses. And I know that that was discussed in, in um, Sandra's talk. Um, you know, dupilumab revolutionized our management of individuals with moderate to severe plaque, psoria, uh, plaque uh, moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Uh, you see the dosing regimens here, and of course, the, the drug was just recently approved uh, down to the age of six months, and I think that is incredibly beneficial. You know, to me, it's challenging because when I think of this severe disease, I do think of children, and um, I'm glad it's finally here, but it really took a long time for that approval, uh, but wonderful that we've had this uh, product in our toolbox for just such a long period of time. And again, and to me, where safety is concerned, when I see more indications for a product, here we have approvals for atopic dermatitis, uh, asthma, uh, rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis, and now eosinophilic esophagitis. There's also a labeling uh, component for the use in a parietal nodularis. To me, that speaks to safety. Um, robust responses from the clinical trials. We even even have easy 90 responses, where about 23% of individuals in the clinical trials. This is some of the pediatric data in the adolescents uh, achieving a very high bar of 90% improvement of the easy score. Um, and, and much uh, the same uh, for down to the age of six to 11. I don't have uh, down to the age of six months in terms of the, the, the data, although it's been widely published recently, and we see these robust response uh, compared uh, to placebo, both with monotherapy and also some of the data uh, with corticosteroids. Uh, interleukin-13 blockers, chalikinimab, which is an interleukin-13 uh, inhibitor. Uh, it is approved for atopic dermatitis uh, only in adults, and you see the dosing regimens here. Adverse events there, uh, typical for clinical trials for atopic dermatitis. Um, conjunctivitis also exists with this agent, um, so it is not exempt from a, uh, conjunctivitis, and there are also some injection site reactions. Here's the clinical trial data, clear and minimal disease, uh, easy 75 responses and uh, reduction, four point reductions in the numeric rating scores for pruritus. And they are very nice, uh, uh, robust responses. And so it's nice to have another agent in the toolbox. I'm showing you some head to head clinical trial data between abracitinib and dupilumab here. And you've probably heard of some of these studies previously. If you look all the way out to the right, these are large population uh, trials. And it's really the higher dosing regimens where we do see some statistically si significant differences in terms of IgA response and also easy 75 responses, so take that into consideration. Otherwise, the starting doses, there's no um, statistically significant differences between these drugs, and very much the same for upatacitinib versus dupilumab. This is called the heads-up uh, study, and again, a very large trial of over 600 patients, almost 700 uh, subjects in the trial, comparing 30 milligrams of upatacitinib uh, to standard dosing regimen uh, of dupilumab. And again, statistically significant differences were seen between treatment group and upatacitinib versus dupilumab, nevertheless, that is the higher dose. 
and really more just for viewing purposes, and you, you can look at this in, in, your, in your handouts uh, and um, from the DEF, uh, just a comparison uh, showing the uh, dosing, the mechanism of action, um, and also uh, the indications for some of these agents. Um, I put up this pie chart here just to show you the plethora of drugs that we both have and are going to have in our toolbox, biologics, uh, oral small molecule agents, topical antibiotics, and really just want to mention as I move into really some of the research part, um, just microbiome affecting therapies and mi microbiologic therapies, probiotics, prebiotics, um, uh, there are a whole host of agents that are coming in this area to market. I want to say a few words about individualizing therapies. Uh, comorbidities are important in atopic dermatitis. And just published a matter of months ago uh, in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology were the uh, guidelines regarding the awareness of comorbidities and their association with atopic dermatitis. And these authors, as uh, Guidelines were led by uh, Don Davis, and in addition to atopic dermatitis itself, the patient and these population level burdens of disease are associated with a variety of comorbidities. And so what did they show in the guidelines and what do we know as it relates to evidence-based medicine and, and, if you will, level one or level A evidence-based uh, medicine? Well, we know in adults there are associations with the atopic uh, diathesis like asthma, food allergies, the allergic triad, if you will, uh, allergic rhinitis, alopecia areata, and the others that you see there. From the standpoint of there being probable associations, and I think this is to be further elucidated, it may be of uh, varieties of cardiovascular disease like hypertension, coronary artery disease. There appear to be some somewhat weak to moderate associations with congestive heart failure, even thromboembolic disease. And I think that needs to be further elucidated because it impacts some of our therapies like Janus kinase inhibitors, obesity, and dyslip dyslipidemia were also highlighted. Um, you know, patient preference is important when we're talking about selecting therapies analyzing and assessing the patient's background comorbidities and the potential for drug-drug inter interactions. And I just talked about you know, some of the challenges that we may have with Janus kinase inhibitors. Uh, really looking at the patient's medication profile is important. What comorbidities have been found to be potentially associated with atopic dermatitis besides those that have been referenced in the recent published data from in the JAD? Well, hydratinitis suppurativa, this may surprise you. And in this particular study that was just published within this past year within the JAD, these authors found an association between hydratinitis suppurativa uh, and atopic dermatitis. Same goes for keloid, surprisingly so. This is a very important study that was published in JAMA Dermatology by David Margolis and colleagues at the South University of Pennsylvania, the association of atopic dermatitis with learning disabilities in children. And what they were looking at in this study was the association of atopic dermatitis and its increasing severity, and was there an impact on learning disabilities? And it turns out that this study suggests that increasing severity of atopic dermatitis does result in some populations in learning disabilities in children. And this is a very large population of uh, individuals uh, with over 2,000 children studied. This raises significant concerns about the burden of disease. So let's jump into some other topics, new strategies, treatment paradigms, and uh, subtypes of atopic dermatitis. And I'd like to highlight the five pillars of atopic dermatitis. You may have heard this at the podium or really online in a whole host of visit videos by our esteemed colleague, Peter Leo. And I really like this as a nice way of looking at atopic dermatitis, where barriers concern and research uh, in psych psychological burden of disease, inflammation, microbiome, and also itch. And so we're going to talk about these five pillars uh, of atopic dermatitis. There are a whole host of articles that have looked at the skin barrier, highlighting the uh, bacterial diversity or lack thereof, and uh, increasing uh, evidence of, of severity of disease as it relates to uh, bacterial diversity. And I'll get into that uh, in a couple of moments. Uh, this very nice paper by Strugar and colleagues highlights the the really immunogenic nature of keratinocytes and also the importance of the lipids and the variety of proteins and various components of the skin barrier like human defensins and catholicidins and that there's such a significant downregulation of antimicrobial peptides in atopic dermatitis. And of course, we, we can't discount the importance of filagrin, this important filament aggregating protein, which is a filament-associated protein that binds to keratin fibers in epithelial cells, uh, 10 to 12 
prophylagrin units are post-translationally hydrolyzed from large prophylagrin precursor proteins during terminal differentiation in epithelial cells. And that's really important in the dysfunction in the skin barrier in atopic dermatitis. And we've been able to, to correlate a lot of these uh, abnormalities as we see in this very unique publication that is an interleukin-4 and 13-induced atopic dermatitis human skin equivalent model done by a skin on chip. And you're probably thinking, Glick is kind of a little crazy. What does this mean? Well, in this study, a microphysiologic system technology has an advantage of creating an environment that is similar to that what we see in vivo. So a skin-on-chip uses a human skin equivalent which has the same characteristics as human skin. And so in this study, a full thickness human skin equivalent was used on a pumpless skin-on-chip stimulating interleukin-4 and interleukin-13 to induce atopic dermatitis. And so it's really unique because we can use that to better understand the relationship between cytokines and the skin barrier. And of course, further study in this regard uh, is necessary. I want to spend a few moments talking about the psychological burden uh, of atopic dermatitis. Dr. Freeman talked a little bit about that yesterday, and it is profound. High rates of depression, anxiety, sleeplessness, skin pain, burning, more sick days, lost time from work, more hospitalization compared to individuals who don't have atopic dermatitis, and there's a substantial overall economic impact to our country of about $3.5 billion, and most of this data comes from the National Eczema Association. Stress, anxiety, uh, psychological burden with this disease is profound. And this was a nice study really confirming stu such that looked at eczema as a shared risk factor for anxiety and depression. This is a meta-analysis and systemic review. Uh, and, and in this study, they demonstrated the pooled effect in a very large cohort of uh, a heightening of eczema separately and anxiety, and also eczema and, and, uh, and uh, anxiety and depression together uh, having significant associations with atopic dermatitis. Uh, not surprising uh, given the incredible burden and the itch burden that we've discussed. I want to spend a couple of minutes just specifically talking about inflammation, uh, Th2 inflammation. Just like when we think of psoriasis and we think of Th1 and Th17 inflammation, here we think primarily of the Th2 and the Th22 pathway. These are uh, immunological reactions that are the fundamental components of the abnormalities in the atopic dermatitis. We know that there are important cytokines of interleukin-4, interleukin-5, interleukin-13, TSLP, uh, interleukin-31, which play key roles uh, in atopic dermatitis. So this study uh, evaluated the multiple roles of many cytokines, and not just even the ones that I referenced, but others that are potential targets for our patients that are suffering with atopic dermatitis. And so in this study that was recently published, they highlighted a whole host of other very important targets, like in individuals that are from uh, the, the Far East, the Asian population, the TH17 uh, class of agents that we are actually, actually already have in our toolbox may be a benefit uh, to patients uh, suffering with atopic dermatitis. Uh, interleukin-22, interleukin-36 potentially serving as a target for individuals with atopic dermatitis. And so we really have a very nice future for our patients with atopic dermatitis. We know that barrier disruption leads to the production of innate lymphoid cells, and we see here the production of uh, Th2 cytokines, Th22 cytokines, and other T cell subsets. And we see the potential targets for some of the newer agents, some of the agents we have already, some that I haven't mentioned, like mepolizumab, which is an interleukin-5 inhibitor, and some drugs like mepolizumab already on the market. We may see these drugs in our toolbox uh, for atopic dermatitis. Drugs like fezikizumab have been studied. The phase two uh, clinical trial data uh, was not necessarily that revealing. We'll see what will happen in the future, whether there, it will be restudied and potentially come to market. And so we've got a lot, got a lot of great products in our toolbox and coming to our toolbox. I want to say a few words about the microbiome. I mean, this is really where it all happens. We see itch. We see the dysfunction in the skin barrier. We see what happens in the microbiome. This was some landmark uh, clinical trial data uh, looking at the changes in bacterial diversity and the impact in atopic dermatitis uh, patients and as far as uh, the SCORAD scores are concerned. 
We see with um, changes in microbial diversity and increasing proportions of Staphylococcus burden in the skin barrier, uh, we see an increase in disease severity. This article published in 2020 really further enhances our knowledge of the impact uh, and the effect on antimicrobial peptides uh, in atopic dermatitis, and further confirmed in this very nice study by Perrick and colleagues demonstrating the uh, abnormalities of the skin my my microbiota in, in atopic dermatitis. Probiotic and prebiotic preparations, as well as skin microbiota transplantation, so things like fecal transplantation, are already playing a role in treating our patients, particularly in those with severe disease. I want to finish up with just talking about itch, and I mentioned before that we can see itch. Patients complain of itch, but we can see it. Look at the severity here. Look at the scratching, the excoriations, the lichenification. These patients really suffer. And a lot of our dermatitis patients have pyrigal nodularis in their background. Itch is an area that remains a significant area of unmet need. Uh, it's growing in our specialty. Dr. Friedman alluded to this yesterday. I think it's a very important area of clinical trial research. Uh, we know that there are neurogenic effects, impact of the imbalance between nerve elongation fi fibers and nerve repulsion fibers, which are responsible for the itch scratch cycle. We know that this increasing nerve elongation contributes to pruritus, it contributes to the itch scratch cycle, and it is driven as well by a variety of cytokines, including interleukin-31. This is further confirmed by this great work that was done by Marty Steinhoff, who was just published this past year. And, and what we see here is uh, our greater understanding of not only skin barrier dysfunction, uh, endogenous factors like cytokine, but the relationship between that skin barrier dysfunction, cytokine burden, and also neurogenic effects as we see here. Uh, we see this central afferent effects uh, from nerve endings, um, impact on kappa, uh, receptors, uh, transient uh, receptor pathways that we know that are activated in the setting of atopic dermatitis. Um, so there is a distinct correlation between inflammatory burden and neurogenic burden as well. I want to close with our therapeutic pipeline. I honed in on this before, and I want to end with this slide. Um, we have a whole host of products that are coming to market, more interleukin-13 inhibitors, um, um, interleukin-31 inhibitors, uh, more Janus kinase inhibitors. I mentioned um, uh, a kappa, kappa receptor blocker in diphelicephalin. Um, there are a whole host of topical therapies, including other Janus kinase inhibitors, PDE4 inhibitors, an arrowhydrocarbon receptor agonist uh, coming to market, and of course, I mentioned uh, other therapeutic measures like uh, fecal microbial transplantation. Uh, I'm going to end it there because I have just a few more slides, but I want to be mindful of time, and this will be available to you. So thank you very much. So I had the privilege of, uh, privilege of actually seeing Dr. Glick deliver that, and I said, I want you to do that in Hamburg. And he said, I can't be in Hamburg, but I can give that to you. Hell, I can get that to you. So I really appreciate him allowing me to give this um, presentation because I think that it, number one, you know, in a space like atopic dermatitis, where I've seen such amazing work by our GAP members, um, I think about the burden of eczema report that came out of EFA over the last year. I think about the sheer decision-making tools that have come out of Allergy and Asthma Network with, I think, Andrea Jensen and Leandra Tonweber on the line. Um, I think about so many of your efforts in this space of atopic dermatitis, of how you're supporting your patients day in, day out, advocating for advancement in policy. Um, and, and we could stop and say, we've helped a lot of people, right? And yet, there's still a lot more to help. And I think that this uh, is, is indicative of, of just how much greater understanding we have about the role of inflammation in a variety of different conditions and diseases. And again, the connection of these themes of things like neuroinflammation that you heard from Dr. Jones and now also from Dr. Glick. So as we go to coffee break, a couple of questions um, I'll, I'll ask here in the room if anyone has a question, if you'll just raise your hand and feel free. Dr. Jones, if you wanna join me here, you can uh, field the question. I do know we had one question online regarding um, biologic use in chronic urticaria and kind of, you know, again, 
differences across the world in dosing reg in what's available and in dosing regimens. But in your experience in the use of biologics in chronic urticaria, um, how is that dose like on a monthly basis? Uh, you know, explain a little bit about that. Yes. Which one am I talking? This one, this one? Okay. <laughs> uh, so currently in the United States, we primarily are going to use omalizumab for chronic spontaneous urticaria. That's dosed monthly. It's like a 300 milligram monthly uh, dose. Um, so yeah. that's primarily what's approved. Yeah, so once a month injection. In yeah. the US, we actually do have home administration now of yep. omalizumab um, for certain patients that physicians agree it's safe and appropriate. So now you can actually administer that product at home. Yeah, Susanna. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. It's a question to you sure. uh, as well. Thank you so much uh, for the approach mm -hmm. that you have. Uh, I wish every single uh, doctor would be like you. Then we would have no problem as patients. So thank you for that. I'm uh, from uh, EFA, European Federation of Allergy and Airways Diseases Patients Associations. And we are doing huge uh, work at the European level on uh, food allergen uh, labeling uh, regulations because those are done, the framework is done at the European level and then how it's uh, implemented in the different countries is a uh, completely another story. And we are also signed up for the so-called Codex Alimentarius uh, mm -hmm. Commission mm -hmm. to, to do this uh, influence work uh, at that level too. But my question is that um, how do you, <laughs> take this in your clinic and with the families and uh, with the patients, meaning how, how do you um, and how would you advise other doctors to do this guidance, give the tools to read, read uh, labels on, uh, on food and how to go into a restaurant and ask for your right to have safe food and uh, or probably you have uh, dietitians or whatever in your Dietitian. team. Oh, yes. uh, so this is a life uh, um, saving and a nutrition skill for the families and uh, patients that they need uh, need every day. Yeah, so how, a, how, how do you do that and so how would you advise others to do that? It's a really great question because food labeling can be so frustrating. Uh, you know, it's always this battle between liability of the companies, but also realistic for the patient and, and, you know, keeping them safe. And so your point, you know, is really well taken. And uh, what we do, we've kind of devised some tools that, that we're able to give in terms of food labeling guidelines according to, I mean, we're in the States, obviously, so according to kind of how foods are labeled in the United States. There's kind of a list on each of the foods that, we're, that we've developed tools where we you know, are able to give it to the patient in hand so that when they're looking at labels, they know what foods to kind of look for, which ones not to look for, um, you know, what certain things may be labeled, in, labeled as that could be masquerading, you know, or not, not masquerading is not the right word, but just they may not realize that it's dairy or they may not realize it's you know, one of the products they're allergic to. So we kind of give lists of, so they have it in hand and can actually take it with them. Um, and so that, that's kind of what we've done and just given instruction. Yeah, and from an advocacy standpoint, I think the point's very important, Susanna, because um, I know as, advoc as patient advocacy organizations, we've done a lot of work to try to get that labeling increased and, and expanded and clarified because a may contains label is really not very effective no. un in, in helping patients to determine should I eat this or not? And what most end up doing is just avoiding if, if that labeling states a may contain or may have trace values. So um, I, it's a, an effort that I think, again, we as a community can continue to elevate and raise the expectation of um, our manufacturers of products, of package manufacturing products, uh, manufactured products, but also of our regulators in communicating this more clearly to patients and families. Yes, Carla. Yeah. Uh, I doubt it. <laughs> For, um, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's not a 
question, but it's just to add. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> It's just to add to that, one of the things uh, Emma Cook, who represents the Japanese um, allergy patient organisation, um, she works with Tomomi, who's um, uh, Japanese and can't speak English, so Emma works with them. Uh, but it, it's also for us as global peers and advocates to actually recognise what the labelling is in each country, because Emma surprised me by saying, ah, but if you see a fish allergy label in Japan, don't be fooled, because it only relates to two types of fish. Yes. Yes. It's not all fish. <laughs> yeah. So actually, if you've got a fish allergy in Japan, just be really careful. So it's our kind of responsibility to make each other aware of that. Um, yeah. So we can it's make it. It's so important. Yeah, aware. absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Is that one? You want to keep that across there? Especially as the world shrinks and we become more global. Yeah. Yeah, it's on. It is. Yeah. Okay. So I think to answer your question too, there's two portions of it, right? There's the regulatory portion of it, which is reading the labels, but from a clinical perspective, utilizing registered dietitians who are educated in food labeling can actually take the time to work directly with the patients to help them have individualized care and to find the foods that they can eat safely and to locate places that they can eat. They tend to have those resources and can, can provide that supplemental care while we all change the uh, the landscape of, of food labeling. So utilizing the allied health providers is really, really important, especially in food allergy because it is a social disease. Yeah, yeah the role of the nutritionist, the dietitian, yes. Dr. Gupta. Uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, uh, Douglas for a fantastic presentation and it really is inspiring. Uh, my question again is from the holistic perspective. We've always been talking of treating food allergy, and that's the point that you raised. Uh, do you have any guidelines on prevention of food allergy? Mm -hmm. Or you, uh, have you been working in that area of prevention of food allergy? Because uh, that's going to be probably a much better solution and a long-term solution. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and that was kind of something I wanted to emphasize because not many people realize the, the Early introduction of food guidelines have been out eight years. I mean, the LEAP study was like eight years ago. You know, it's surprising it's been that long, but there's been such little discussion. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe prevention's like a new concept to Western medicine. Uh, <laughs> they're not quite used to <laughs> that. We, we actually do have an early introduction of food program in our clinic. And so what I did was I, did a in-service or workshop with all the pediatricians uh, in our area, and I said, these are the children you know, that are at risk, and, and I kind of gave them tools to be able to do low-risk cases in their clinics, but in any higher-risk cases that they weren't comfortable with, I guaranteed them that I would see the patient within a week, uh, because weeks count in the early introduction of foods. And where my clinic is normally booked out months, you know, one of their concerns was, can we get them in in time? And so we worked a system just collaboratively with the pediatricians and said, I guarantee you, you know, that patient's gonna be seen within the week, we'll have proper evaluation and we'll get the food introduced. And so, yes, we've not only done it in our clinic, but I've had outreach to our pediatricians and then the other thing, just from a holistic point of view, is we're also looking at even an early age. You know, what's the diet like? What's their sleep like? What's the parental anxiety like? What's, you know, the, the social interactions? Um, if we need to, we'll do some testing, you know, for uh, inflammatory markers or uh, gut health or any, any of those things. It's more of a case-by-case -case basis, but we'll definitely not only do early introduction of foods, but also look at the child as a whole when they're coming in. Yeah, and to that point around prevention, I know um, one of the areas that you're passionate about is the use of technology to spread access to specialty care. So yes. why don't you speak about that on the prevention note as we close out and head to coffee like, break? Hello? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... And, and just Australia and kind of your work across, yeah. So um, one of the silver linings of COVID that, that we've talked about a lot is the better use of telehealth, uh, of using technology, of being able to have outreach. Um, so 
The other nice thing, and I'm really glad you brought that up, because the other aspect of this with early introduction of foods is we can easily get on telehealth and we don't even have to bring some of the children into clinic. We can have the, in, in lower risk cases, the parents do it at home, you know, under a telehealth visit and under our guidance. And w one of the things we've done is I'm actually piloting a clinic in Australia right now where um, I don't have a license to practice there. So what I've had to do is uh, we, we've started a clinic, we've co-founded a clinic and then trained doctors, pediatricians, nurses, and a staff there to do not only early introduction of foods, but uh, food allergy treatment. And I'm able to manage that, over, have oversight from the United States and be able to give them instruction and kind of that hands-on no matter where I am. And so we're able to utilize the technology in that way to have greater outreach. and really kind of one of my goals is to bring treatment to patients, no, no matter where they are. Yeah, so in this discussion of advancing the science, let us not forget that there are very pragmatic technical, techno technological advances that have also helped us to advance the way care is delivered throughout the world and will continue to be delivered throughout the world. Um, so I hope that, again, this first session, yeah, yeah. So along that line, and it, and it gets back to one of my slides, is if no matter where you are in the world, if you think we can't do that, message me and let me seek for a solution to where you can do something in a pragmatic way. Yeah. yeah. In a safe, pragmatic safe. way. Safe. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Carlo, quickly. Yeah, yeah. Lines, literally this week, yes. so I've got the Q code for it, QR code, so I can send it around. Yes, and send it to Victor so he can put it in the chat, and then yeah. we can share it more broadly. Yes, yep. that would be great. Yeah, so such amazing work being done by all of you throughout the world. And again, I hope you've enjoyed this first half of the scientific meeting. We're going to take about a 10-minute break and return at 15 past the top of the hour to continue our program. So for those of you online, we'll see you in about 10 minutes. For those of you here in the room, there are refreshments as well as the uh, toilets and water closets right out the door. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Are cameras ready? All right. Welcome back, everyone. We hope you enjoyed the coffee break. Uh, next up, we are going to turn our focus to environmental influences in allergy and asthma. And I do apologize that this is the wrong presenter information here on the slide, I realized uh, th this morning. But we are going to hear from Professor Holloway at Southampton. However, it's Professor John Holloway who graduated with a BS in biochemistry from New Zealand and has since worked at South Haven at South Southampton and Malagon Institute um, in the genetic basis of asthma. He has worked with uh, the heads of the respiratory genetics group in the Human Development and Health and Clinical Experimental Sciences School alongside Stephen Holgate and others. And he was appointed as a personal chair at the Faculty of Medicine in 2011 and has ongoing research in environmental influences in this space, as well as he contributes to clinical pharmacology and molecular cell biology teaching as part of the Bachelor's of Medicine program there at Southampton. So yes, yeah, so uh, my group uh, has been working for uh, 20 years or more now, trying to understand the answer to the question, why do some people develop allergic disease and other people don't? Um, we know that it's a combination of both environmental and genetic factors that are important, and it's the interaction of those that will determine whether any one individual will develop an allergic disease and at what time in life they do that. Uh, so just for those who aren't uh, particularly aware, I'll just start with a very brief introduction of allergic disease. So allergic disease is focused around um, uh, sort of T-helper-2 type inflammation, uh, generating an IgE antibodies, uh, and when you uh, are sensitized to a uh, allergen uh, and you encounter that allergen again, you'll generate an immune response, uh, which can cause symptoms in different organs depending on the type of allergy you have. So it's not just whether you're allergic or not, it's if you are allergic, whether you will develop clinical symptoms and what symptoms you will develop. And so when we think about the genetics, there are going to be some commonalities between all allergic conditions, which are about the type of immune, system, immune response you make, uh, how sensitive you are to triggers, um, the strength of the inflammatory response you make. And there are going to be some differences because there are 40% of us more will be sensitive to an allergen. So if we, uh, if we do a skin prick test, put bits of allergen on the skin and, and pierce the skin with a, uh, a needle, uh, about 40% of us will react to a common allergen. You know, it could be pollen or a house dust mite or a uh, food allergen. But only 20% or 15% of us will uh, have respiratory uh, allergy uh, or slightly more uh, will have nasal allergy, rhinitis or hay fever um, or uh, skin allergy, so atopic dermatitis or more rare food allergy, so allergic reactions uh, in the GI tract, uh, and very rarely uh, systemic allergy, so anaphylaxis, sort of severe allergic response, uh, multi-system that can be life-threatening. So when we think about the genetics, we need to think about the genetics of allergen sensitization, but also the genetics of what we uh, sometimes term the end organ. So if I'm allergic, why do I develop asthma? or atopic dermatitis, or why am I just sensitized and don't develop uh, clinical symptoms? So as I said, my PhD was on the genetics of asthma, trying to understand why some people develop asthma. And that got me thinking about the question, when is the point in life at which someone begins to develop an allergic disease? Uh, is it when they first encounter an allergen? or other things that are already established before that point that mean when they encounter the allergen, they'll develop that uh, sensitization, and then on subsequent re-exposure, develop allergic symptoms. And if you sit down and think about it, at birth or shortly after birth, you can look at physiological parameters and the different organs that are affected by allergic disease, and you can already see differences 
in infants who are subsequently going on to develop allergic disease compared to those who don't. So you can look in the skin and you can see that uh, infants who go on to develop atopic dermatitis will have a different uh, rate of trans or water loss. So there's a difference in the skin barrier. You can look uh, at lung function in infants and you will see differences in lung function in infants who subsequently go on to develop asthma compared to those who don't. And you can take immune cells, so from cord blood, and you can stimulate them and you can look at the effect of molecules that are generated, the cytokine profile, uh, proliferation and things. Uh, and you, again, people have shown differences at birth in immune responses in infants who subsequently go on to develop allergic disease compared to those who don't. So at this point, we have genetic influences and we can have environmental influences. So the environment before you're born, the maternal environment uh, while uh, the individual was developing in utero, have already influenced the allergic disease trajectory by the time of birth. So that takes the when question back in time, not age five, perhaps when you first develop uh, asthma symptoms, but it takes it back to uh, before birth. So what could be influencing uh, developmental trajectories that lead you to the susceptibility at birth, these differences at birth. So part of it can be genetic because we have our genetics from the moment of conception. And part of it could be epigenetic because epigenetic factors respond to the environment. And we know that the environment in that uh, period of development in utero can influence risk of uh, allergic disease subsequently. So I'm not going to talk too much about the genetics of allergic disease today. Um, this is a, a nice summary of several decades of studies from around the world doing genome-wide association studies, uh, trying to find genetic variants that predispose towards allergic disease. And you can see we have a whole range of different uh, genes, uh, different levels of significance uh, that have been identified using this genome-wide association approach. So we know that genetics are important, but we know it's not the only thing. So you can be genetically susceptible to asthma, but you will not develop asthma uh, if you don't encounter the right environment at the right point in your life. So as I said, the environment's important, and we know that multiple different environmental risk factors have been associated with risk of developing uh, allergic diseases. Uh, so they include things like indoor and outdoor air pollution, uh, diet, infection, allergen exposure, uh, exposure to medications, it goes on and on. There's a whole list of different environmental factors that have been shown to predispose people towards uh, different uh, allergic disease. And of course, these factors interact. So the, it isn't a sort of additive uh, process. I have a defined genetic risk and a defined environment risk, and if I add the two together, am I over a threshold of a developed disease? getting these uh, synergistic interactions between the two. Uh, and this is just one example, um, a paper that was published uh, almost 15 years ago now, looking at a particular genetic variant uh, that had been shown to be associated with risk of asthma. It's a variant in a gene called CD14, which is a component of the innate immune response. Uh, CD14 senses uh, a molecule called uh, endotoxin. It's present in the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. And we know that endotoxin exposures uh, were associated with uh, protection from allergic disease. And so you can see here we've got our three genotype groups for the CD14 gene. And at low endotoxin levels in the home, you can see that this uh, CC genotype uh, is the risk genotype uh, for allergic sensitization. But at high endotoxin levels in the home, you're actually getting a reversal of the effect. And here, the CC genotype is protect, uh, protective, uh, and it's a, a T allele that seems to be uh, a risk allele. So you're getting these uh, complex interactions between environmental exposure and genetic background determining an individual's risk. So you need to consider all of them together. You can't just look at one alone. And we know that's true because, uh, you know, we spent many years, lots of money, hundreds of thousands of people identifying genetic variants in genome-wide association studies that predispose towards allergic disease. But if we try and use genetics alone to predict who will develop allergic disease, the predictions aren't particularly good. 
So we need to combine with environmental exposures and other things to be able to assess an individual's risk. But what about uh, epigenetics? It was in the title of the talk, so uh, I had to get to it at some point. Where does epigenetics come uh, in this picture? So just a brief introduction, what we mean by epigenetics. So epigenetics are these processes uh, above the genome, so molecular changes within cells that alter the regulation of transcription, but don't alter the sequence of the DNA in the genome. So they're robust, but also uh, flexible to change. So by that, I mean that they're stable through mitosis. So you can take a cell as a particular epigenetic profile, that cell will divide and it will retain that epigenetic profile. Okay. So epigenetic profiles are telling a cell what it is. It's telling an airway epithelial cell, it's an airway epithelial cell, and when it divides, it's still an airway epithelial cell. And we know that's true because we can take an adult differentiated cell, a fibroblast, for example, we can transfect the MLR factors in there, we can wipe this epigenetic program, and we have an induced pluripotent stem cell that can become any type of cell with the right environmental stimulus, the right cofactors, uh, growth factors, et cetera, in the medium, because the environment will change the epigenetic profile and lead to cellular differentiation. So they allow us to change gene expression in response to environment. As I said, they're stable through mitosis. And towards the end of the talk, I'll give you some evidence that suggests that some of these epigenetic factors can be stable through meiosis as well, and that maybe we can get transmission of epigenetic uh, memory uh, between generations. Uh, it's sort of a catch-all term, lots of different uh, cellular mechanisms are sort of lumped into the epigenetic bucket. Um, but really what we're talking about is a combination of different things, whether that's post-translational modification of histones, uh, DNA methylation, that ultimately affect remodeling a chromatin, accessibility of the chromatin to transcription factors, and therefore regulating uh, transcription. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking uh, in, sorry, uh, mainly about uh, DNA methylation, adding methyl groups to CPGs, the dinucleotides, so adding a, a methyl group to the cysteine, followed by guanine in the genome. And the reason that I'll concentrate on that mainly is because in human epidemiological studies, uh, we can measure DNA methylation and DNA samples uh, relatively easily. And all the DNA samples we collected over many years for genetic studies of disease, we can also measure methylation in those same DNA samples. Whereas most of us who have these large human cohorts, uh, we spent a lot of time and money collecting, uh, didn't process uh, the, the uh, DNA at the time in a way that we could measure um, uh, other things like uh, histone changes uh, in the samples that we have. Um, so that's not to say they're not important. Um, they are because really it's the complex of chromatin remodeling that ultimately is the consequence of both histone and methylation changes. But I'll talk about methylation now as a sort of uh, relatively easy output to measure in large scale human studies. <clears throat> And as I said, epigenetic mechanisms regulate cellular differentiation. They tell a cell what it is, and we can, from a uh, differentiated cell, we can create an epi uh, induced pluripotent stem cell by wiping the epigenetic memory of that cell. So if we think uh, environment is important in susceptibility to allergic disease and genetics are important, where does epigenetics come in? So if we think epigenetics can change in response to environment, uh, is there any evidence that environmental exposures that are risk factors for allergic disease uh, modify the epigenome in individuals? So we can test that out. We can take human studies where we extract DNA from individuals, we look at their environmental exposure, and we say, can we see differences in the methylome based on the environmental exposure? And in the literature, there is a whole range of different environmental exposures, whether that's maternal uh, nutrition during pregnancy, uh, growing up on a farm, which is a protective factor for allergic disease, particularly farms with animals. Um, so definitely 
small children need to play with animals out on the farm. Um, uh, air pollution, another example. Uh, season of birth is another risk factor for uh, allergic disease. Uh, and these have all been associated with differences in DNA methylation in individuals. So we can see a relationship between the environment and the methylation, but is that relevant to uh, development of disease? We do these types of studies, uh, epigenome-wide association studies, uh, by uh, using uh, commonly uh, arrays, high-density arrays, um, the latest generation survey about uh, 850,000 CPG sites across the genome where we can measure the methylation quantitatively uh, between 0 and 1 or 0% and 100% at, at specific uh, uh, CPG sites across the genome. And the things we've learned from doing these type of studies is that when you look at an environmental exposure and the methylome, you see specific changes in the methylome in response to specific environmental exposures. So whatever the process that leads from environmental exposure to a change in epigenome, it is specific to the exposure. So different exposures will give you a different signature. So this is one example, um, uh, a meta-analysis from the Pregnancy and Childhood Epigenetics Consortium uh, led by uh, Professor Stephanie London. Uh, we contributed some of the data to this meta-analysis. So this is looking at uh, the association so is the level of significance with CPGs across the genome, and here they are positioned by chromosome, uh, for the level of methylation being associated with uh, whether the mother smoked during pregnancy or not. And so we're taking DNA of the child at birth, so cord blood DNA. We're measuring the methylation of the child, and we're saying, is the methylation at specific CPG sites associated with the mother's environmental exposure uh, during pregnancy? And you see very strong association at specific CPG sites that are consistent across cohorts from different parts of the world and different environmental backgrounds. So the smoking exposure is giving you a specific signature that's consistent despite the variability of other factors in uh, the different groups that contribute data to the study. It's always nice when you get p-values of 10 to the minus 100 and whatever makes you believe that the association is uh, true. And we learned from studies like this and now subsequently many other studies looking at uh, in utero ex environmental exposures uh, and methylation profiles of infants and children that a specific environmental exposure will give you a specific uh, epigenetic signature. We also could see that these effects persist. So if you look in older children, uh, in this case, uh, five of the cohorts that are involved in the analysis had uh, DNA samples collected later in childhood, uh, that you could see the same signature. So the effect persisted. It wasn't an effect you could measure at birth, shortly after the environmental exposure of mother smoking during pregnancy. Later in childhood, you could still see the same epigenetic signature. And in fact, uh, we've gone on uh, with my Eureka Yarvalin and the Northern Finnish birth cohort, and others have done this as well now, to look in adults and look at the DNA methylation in blood from adults compared to whether their mother smoked when they were pregnant with them. And we see the same DNA signature that we see in the children and in the cord blood. So that epigenetic memory, if you like, of that exposure during pregnancy has persisted through to uh, the fourth or fifth decade of life. So is it just a biomarker of exposure or does it actually mean in something in terms of susceptibility to disease? We know that genetic factors can also change the epigenome. So you can look for association between genetic variants and epigenetic changes. Uh, so we often turn these, if we're looking at methylation, uh, methylation quantitative trait loci. So this is where methylation at a specific base pair, specific CPG site, varies depending on the sequence at an adjacent or uh, sometimes uh, far distant uh, signal nucleoside polymorphism. Uh, so this paper that was uh, published about two years ago and it led by uh, Josie Min, again, combined data from lots of different cohorts, uh, including ours, where DNA methylation data was available, 
and also genome-wide association data or genome-wide genotyping was available. And what they did was to build a catalog of these MetQTLs uh, to identify um, uh, over 270,000 CPG sites where the methylation was associated with genotype. So then the question is, well, is that how a genetic variant might lead to disease? Could it be through altering epigenetic profiles which regulate gene expression, which then change phenotype? And so you can, do, you can ask the questions, is it just that you've got a SNP that predisposes towards disease and you've got a methylation site that predisposes towards disease and they happen to be close to each other? Or are they actually on the causal pathway? Is it the SNP affects the methylation, the methylation affects the disease? And you can use a statistical approach uh, of Mendelian randomization to try and assess whether these are causal or not. In fact, the answer is that yes, while genetics affects methylation at lots of different sites, for most diseases, it, do, it seems to be independent effects. It's not that the genetic effect associated with disease is working through changing the DNA methylation. Um, it's probably not universal though. So you, look, in this case, they look for enrichment of particular disease associated genetic variants in this uh, catalog. Uh, and for allergic disease, allergic dermatitis, atopic dermatitis or eczema, uh, SNPs were enriched uh, in these MetQTLs, but uh, not asthma. But at specific sites, so 17 q 2 one is the strongest genetic effect for susceptibility to asthma. And here you see co-localization, so at the same genetic uh, location of uh, SNPs that affect disease and SNPs that affect um, methylation at that locus as well. And of course, looking within a single gene, you can begin to see these interaction effects as well. So this was a paper we published uh, almost 10 years ago now, where we looked at a specific gene, in this case, the interleukin-4 receptor, so part of the immune uh, uh, system. And we're looking at uh, three different genotype groups across a range of methylation levels in our cohort. So we can measure methylation at CPG sites in the gene, we can measure the genotype, and we can say, what's the risk of developing uh, allergic disease. And we can see that at low levels of methylation, we're seeing no difference between genetic groups. And at higher levels of methylation at the CPG site, we begin to see the differences uh, in risk by genotype. So you're getting these interactions between the epigenetic profile within a gene and the genetic profile uh, in the genome of the individual, determining the risk of developing disease in an individual. So genetics can affect methylation, environment can affect methylation. Those effects are specific and they're stable throughout life. Are they associated with uh, risk of disease? So again, I'm showing you data from another uh, PACE cohort analysis. This is looking at DNA methylation at birth in children and saying, is methylation at specific CPG sites associated with later development of asthma in those children? Uh, and the answer is uh, yes. So you can see uh, significant, not a huge number, but a number of CPG sites where the methylation at birth is associated with later risk of developing. Uh, in this case, it was a phenotype called wheeze, which is sort of uh, bronchial symptoms, which is related to asthma. It's not quite the same as clinical asthma, but it's what is often measured in cohorts uh, before we can get a clinical diagnosis. <laughs> but uh, other studies in single cohorts have also shown association between methylation early in life and later development of uh, allergic disease. Uh, this is one such study uh, that we did in our Isle of Wight cohort. Uh, in this case, we're looking at DNA methylation at birth. Uh, we didn't have cord blood in this cohort, but we did have uh, Guthrie cards, so blood spots and filter paper that were collected uh, when these children were born uh, over 30 years ago. We could extract DNA from those uh, blood spots uh, and measure the methylone in the same way as we get from uh, our blood DNA. And uh, we could then relate that methylation, which was taken you know, a week after birth, to, uh, in this case, lung function trajectories measured throughout childhood up to uh, age 26. Uh, and again, we could show that methylation at birth was associated whether you had a, 
uh, a low lung function growth trajectory or a high lung function growth tra uh, trajectory uh, that in itself is then related to risk of developing asthma. So epigenetics, influenced by genetics, influenced by environment, stable throughout life and associated with uh, risk of disease. But again, the question is, uh, is it cause or effect? So is the environment giving you an epigenetic signature? Is it the epigenetics that is then actually causing you to develop the disease? Or is it just a biomarker of the environmental exposure? And the environmental exposure is causing disease through altering development in some way or altering growth in childhood uh, and uh, having a direct effect on uh, risk of disease. Well, we can begin to look at that. We can look at it in terms of timing. So again, if you do cross-sectional studies of, uh, say, case control of people with disease and without disease and look at um, uh, epigenetic profiles, you'll see lots of differences between people with and without disease. Most of those differences will be because there are differences in tissue composition between your cases and your controls, particularly for immune-mediated disorders. If you're looking at blood-derived DNA, you will see a difference in DNA methylation profile of individuals depending on how many neutrophils they have, how many T cells, what T cell subsets are within the blood. So uh, in cohort studies, we can use timing. So we can say we measured methylation at this point in time when there were no clinical differences between individuals, and we can associate it with subsequent risk. Uh, but again, could it just be a biomarker of some environmental exposure that is driving disease and not on the causal pathway? But we can also use statistical approaches uh, uh, to um, sort of things like mediation analysis and uh, Mendelian randomization to try and show whether uh, the environmental exposure is associated with the outcome via DNA methylation or not. And this is just one example that we published a couple of years ago, uh, looking, in this case, uh, BMI trajectories through childhood between birth and 10, which we knew were associated with risk of developing asthma across adolescence. Uh, we measured methylation at 10. We could find association between the trajectories and the methylation, the methylation and the disease. And so at least in part, DNA methylation appeared to be an intermediate between this exposure and this outcome. So it may lie on the causal pathway rather than just being a biomarker of the exposure. So we believe that uh, epigenetics is an important integrator, if you like, of a range of different exposures, both genetic and environmental, uh, that can then lead to predisposition to disease years or decades later. Thank you so much, Dr. Holloway. Um, I know that was heavy science, especially right after the break, everyone, we probably need to stretch and wake up and just make sure that our bloods are flowing. Um, but I, you know, I was saying during the break, I think it's so important that we as patient advocates understand the level of science that is behind the research and what is to come for our patient community. Many of us in this room have spent you know, years, if not decades, working in our given area, whether that be allergy, atopic dermatitis, um, asthma, COPD, you know, so many different spaces, food allergy, uh, again, rare disease. There are so many different conditions represented in this group. And as I think about, again, those environmental influences across all of these, this is where the science is evolving to help us understand how important, even in utero, what's happening in an individual's life, right? And how both genetics and environment are shaping and priming that individual for a lifetime of living with atopic and airways disease. And so that's why I think that some of this, I know it's deep science, but I hope that you understand the rationale behind us bringing these experts together today. So in our last session, we're going to look at asthma and COPD, new horizons for hope. And our speaker is Dr. Ansham Aurora, who is a qualified board certified pulmonologist and allergist uh, from New Delhi. And so she is a lifetime member of the American College of Chess Physicians and is one of the very few pulmonologists in India to have qualified as a European 
diploma in adult respiratory medicine, which is a symbol of global excellence in the field of pulmonology. She's also a lifetime member of the Indian Chest Society and the European Respiratory Society, and has been awarded a fellowship by the Asian Pacific Society of Respirology. Um, recently, uh, Dr. Ensham was awarded the prestigious D. Dr. M. Santosham Gold Medal of Excellence uh, in her subject of pulmonary from New Delhi. And so now we're going to focus on 15 key changes to the GINA guidelines in 2023. What is the most relevant changes in the asthma guidelines for us as patient advocates? And then we'll turn the focus to gold. Hello everyone, Pulmonology Read Aloud welcomes you to the new May 2023 release of GINA guidelines. GINA guidelines are updated every year and if you haven't seen it earlier, I recommend that you first see the GINA guidelines 2022 video to have an in-depth review of what entailed in the asthma guidelines. Now the, those were a major change guidelines and this time there's uh, there's more that is added as an update based on the evidence collected over the past one year. So the backbone of the guideline really remains the same as 2022. And oh, today what we're going to do is we're going to understand the key changes that this guideline has brought about. Now this is a 246 page document on the same format as the previous GINA documents. Um, what is helpful is that they have really try to answer the questions and the problems that are faced in general practice leading to asthma management and they've also uh, given future directions they've talked about something that is going to come new so we are expecting more documents from the gina committee um, something that i realize is lacking still is uh, information on newer drugs newer steroids inhaled steroids uh, the ultra long acting bronchodilators still not enough information on biologic therapy not enough guidance on it the chapter on severe asthma is more or less similar to what it was last time uh, but definitely a lot of concepts have been cleared a lot of drug treatments have been clarified so let's get started and the first change amongst this 15 key changes is about the inhaler terminology. We all uh, know that two kinds of terminology were initially used, the reliever and the maintenance and controller. And last year only, the ball was set rolling um, where the reliever or SABA use uh, was really discouraged in uh, track one being the preferred treatment. So here again, they have clarified that uh, you do not use the term controller, you use the term maintenance inhaler or you use the term ICS containing treatment or you use the term anti-inflammatory reliever and maintenance and reliever therapy or MAP therapy. So basically what it wants to say is that by saying that uh, reliever, we don't want anybody to confuse with SABA because SABA is no longer preferred alone. So use the terms ICS containing regimen so that even the patient and the doctor both, they understand the significance of giving inhaled corticosteroids. So basically when you talk about treatment terminology, maintenance treatment which is to be given regularly on a scheduled basis can now be called as a anti-inflammatory reliever also. We do not use the terms controller now. We would prefer to use maintenance treatment or ICS containing regimen. Here, when we are talking about this, the controllers earlier were ICS containing mostly and to avoid this confusion, this substitution has been done. When we talk about anti-inflammatory reliever, we again want to say that this will be a medicine, a reliever medicine, which will contain not only a rapid acting bronchodilator, but also a low dose inhaled corticosteroid. So anti-inflammatory relievers will be preferred over SAB alone. Some patients will require only anti-inflammatory reliever therapy as SOS. So patients in step one and two, and some patients would require maintenance anti-reliever therapy as the maintenance. Now, uh, repeatedly, again and again, uh, something that was very important and something was brought about, a lot of uh, discussions 
were around it where in ICS formatrol was prescribed and we used to um, synonymously use these terms uh, with other ICS slava combinations and say that although Gina has repeatedly used ICS formatrol we kind of could use it in others as well now they've specified that the evidence over many years is lacking so what whatever they talk about is mostly ICS formatrol because most evidence comes from it in clinical trials and although you could replace ICS formatrol with other combinations the evidence is not robust in other combinations and even in MART most evidence of using maintenance therapy will be with ICS uh, budesonide and formatrol combination or beclomethasone and formatrol combination. So this really brings into question the multitude of inhaler combinations that we have across and whether all of them can be used for giving maintenance and reliever therapy. So just remember that it's budesonide formatrol and beclomethasone formatrol that mostly have evidence for MART therapy. Now, something which has also been stressed is the regarding the explanation of the asthma cycle to the patient and the importance of looking at this wheel again and again. So assess your patient, adjust his treatment and review his treatment. And so when we talk about assessment, make sure you have confirmed your diagnosis, make sure the reversibility in uh, spirometry is there. You have controlled, assessed the risk factors seen the comorbidities and when you're adjusting it make sure you're doing all measures to adjust yes asthma treatment as well as the morbidity related treatment and have stepped up or down and review your patients at intervals and they have clearly demarcated what should be the timeline so now if you look at gina uh, treatment as a third change they've talked about as needed ICS Saba. So earlier if you remember in track one we had the preferred controller and reliever and the MART therapy. This is preferred steps where we keep adding the ICS dose and give maintenance ICS formatrol but track two instead of just Saba there is recent evidence from a trial which says that if you add ICS with Saba, you add butyrsonide with your Saba, you will have lesser exacerbation. So in resource limited settings, when you are using TRAC2, you preferably use it with butyrsonide or with ICS and that is what is a major change. Now coming to this TRAC1, again the emphasis has been on emphasizing that track one is the preferred treatment in adults and adolescents so when you're treating your patients the evidence is in track one it reduces emergency visits it reduces hospitalizations and it gives us the ability to give a simplified approach to the patient in the form of mart so track two is never your preferred way always track one will be the preferred management now there's been some change also on the guidance on medicines, the doses and the assessment in track one and they've realized that there was a lot of confusion in what dose to give, what is low dose, what is medium dose, what is high dose. So they have given beautiful boxes and tables to um, signify that and they've again as I said uh, emphasized that ICS formatrol is the preferred treatment approach. And the step up and the step down is both important uh, because it will reduce the incidence of severe exacerbations. And this cannot be done with any other ICS lava because evidence for MART and step up, step down is with ICS formatrol. And you can also use it with for exercise induced as well as because of allergen exposure if their patient has an exacerbation it can be used for both as MART therapy and um, most evidence which is with butyrsonide and formatrol comes with the dose of 206 microgram meter dose which is equivalent to a delivered dose of 160 micrograms of butyrsonide and 4.5 
micrograms of formatrol. So again, it raises a question of giving higher doses of formatrol as in certain combinations that are available to us, whether we should be giving 12 microgram formatrol in the uh, combinations or we should just stick to the 6 microgram. Gina definitely endorses 206 combination and then this can be stepped up and stepped down and 106 for children and uh, for SOS use if your patient is taking a 206 combination then patient has to take another extra inhalation of ICS formatrol. They also specify that for using MART therapy there is no specific time boundation when the patient should wait. So uh, if we talk about the duration of action of ICS formatrol being 12 hours, there is no need for the patient to wait for 12 hours to take the MART as the reliever therapy. So he can take another extra dose, um, unlike Saba. And however, when the patient is using 206 combination, the maximum dosages that he can take in a day would be 12 and not more than that. But they hardly require those dosages and usually maximum some patients can go as high as 8. So this is very important because the dosages is very important to understand. So again, a beautiful table given for doses of MART uh, and remember that this is via DPI. So here they've talked about dosages which are ideal via DPI and they have clarified that if you're giving budesonide formatrol via MDI, then you would half the strength of that with the relevant DPI and you can double the number of doses given above. So if patient is on step 1, 2, he's only on SOS therapy, air only, then budesonide formatrol, he can use it one inhalation whenever needed when he's using with PMDI, right? So a dosage with DPI, one inhalation, and whenever he's using with PMDI, you have to tell him to increase double the number of doses, but try and use an inhaler with half the strength of the relevant DPI. Step three marked again in adolescents as well as elderly. Formatrol budesonide 206 or beclomethasone formatrol 106. One inhalation of DPI once or twice a day plus one inhalation whenever needed. Step four marked two inhalations twice a day and one inhalation for children and plus one inhalation whenever needed. Step five, patient on MART, two inhalations twice a day, effective dose becomes 412, 400 of budesonide uh, and six formatrol and one inhalation whenever needed. Also, it's important when you're increasing the dosage to review and response. And when do we review the patient? The answer is three to four months of therapy, but review for an exacerbation within a week and regular follow-up at one to three months of therapy. That's very important. And this is the time where you would either step him up or step him down. So day-to-day -day patient uh, can vary for his anti-inflammatory reliever therapy as SOS. Short term step up, he can do according to asthma action plan when he sees deterioration and a sustained step up for at least up to three months to be done when you feel that the patient doesn't have a good response. For step down, a beautiful table has been provided where they mention that you should consider stepping down when you have your patient well controlled, the lung function has been stable, he's been on therapy for three or more months and if he has exacerbations, then you take that into consideration as an evaluation whether you should be stepping down. Choose an appropriate time. All of us do that in our practice. We choose a time where there's not much pollution, there's not much allergen, a time where the patient has less chances of an exacerbation because of a viral infection. We give him clear instructions as to when he can step up and we give him a written asthma action plan. And when you want to step down, you ideally step down 
inhaled corticosteroid doses by 25 to 50 percent after the three months that is safe for most patients this comes as evidence a a robust evidence so if your patient is currently on step 5 which is high dose ics lava plus oral steroid therapy when you are stepping down you would optimize the therapy and reduce the oral steroid first you can also reduce the inhaled steroid uh, later on and uh, remember that oral corticosteroids is never the preferable approach um, on long term in severe asthmatics so we will try to reduce oral steroids as much as possible and here this patient can be considered for biologics step four moderate to high dose ics you continue the combination but you reduce the ics component and if you feel that discontinuation of lava leads to deterioration then continue that because it has been noted in trials and we, we discontinue lava there are more exacerbations so be careful on that front step three patients who are on a low dose again you reduce it from twice to once and see and for patients who are on low dose maintenance ICS alone, again try to switch them to once daily and switch them to SOS if needed. So step down has to be very careful. Also, whenever you're stepping down, remember there are risk factors and you want to make sure that this patient who has more risk factors is on an ICS containing regimen and is on anti-inflammatory reliever therapy with a good asthma action plan and depending on the risks like tobacco smoke cigarette smoking obesity psychological issues allergies we can taper the treatment and arrange the other assessments the next update is about treatment in children and something which has been added in children if you see this is the 2022 flow chart it talks about step 5 anti-IG and anti-IL-4 receptor antibody as biologics but recent RCT have shown that if a patient is on step 5 even in 6 to 11 year age group they can be given mepolizumab so anti-IL-5 has been added now and um, the new chart shows anti-IL-5 as a part of addition in step 5 so that has shown a reduction in severe exacerbations and so that is a added uh, option available for children of this age group number seven treatment in five years old and younger so there have been few changes in treatment uh, for patients who are less than five so pediatric population they have really clarified that we still don't have good evidence for continuing maintenance in such children most children less than five years have wheezing associated respiratory illness so these patients may require bursts of uh, nebulizations with inhaled corticosteroids or sabas so in these children whether maintenance treatment should be given or not be given is still not clear there's still insufficient evidence so if you look at this flow chart for these children you have only ics as either daily dose or double the low dose or continuation as a controller which is questionable so this subgroup has insufficient evidence for controllers now number eight inhaler choice and its environmental considerations gina guidelines have really made it more holistic this time this is a beautiful figure that has been added where they talk about choosing the inhaler not only based on the medication the patient's own preferences the training but also being more environmentally conscious we know there's a lot of plastic uh, involvement with inhalers uh, which could fill the landfills so they want us to choose properly whether we want inhalers that are multi-use, uh, which have a potential for recycling. And uh, we are using now HFA-based inhalers instead of CFC. So that is one step closer to being environmentally conscious. But they have stressed upon it with, uh, uh, with a separate uh, area dedicated to inhaler choice. Coming to the next major change, uh, which is advice for low medium income countries so track 2 which is uh, the optional regimen uh, may be the preferred regimen for certain lower and medium income countries and Gina acknowledges that fact and um, 
the search of availability of ICS lava combinations all across the globe that's very important and they have placed a lot of emphasis on uh, making more and more uh, arrangements for that and policies towards that number 10 very important change is on mild asthma now even in 2022 mild asthma term was talked about and they said that mild asthma does not mean that the patient will not have exacerbations so do not use that term now here again they have completely asked to replace the term mild asthma because it does not equate to a low risk of asthma exacerbation or asthma death so a new terminology called apparently mild asthma has been given uh, we could use this term apparently mild asthma to highlight that some patients may not have symptoms enough but the risk may still be high and they've also mentioned that the definition of mild asthma can be different in different scenarios for trials for epidemiological studies uh, we may need to know whether this patient is on sava alone whether this patient requires ics on and off so those terminologies which are more descriptive should be preferred do not use the term mild asthma change number 11 severe asthma management update uh, most of these flowcharts are same but they have emphasized that although they have given biologics as an option make sure it is done only in severe asthma patients where you've optimized treatment and uh, for more details you can see my video on severe asthma and biologics and the importance of assessing a patient with severe asthma to make sure he's the right candidate for biologic Change number 12 on exacerbations. This flowchart, this diagram and table exists in 2022 guidelines as well. But um, there have been certain changes in medicines and the doses in exacerbation. They emphasize that all patients who are having an exacerbation change their management in accordance with the written asthma plan. They increase their reliever. They increase their controller. Now, reliever here as as we discussed in the first slide is anti-inflammatory reliever preferably so the patient who's on low dose ics formatrol uh, he will increase the frequency of as needed low dose ics formatrol as the first step for a patient who was not on ics formatrol and is on saba he will increase saba and for patient who's on combination of ICS and SABA will increase frequency of ICS SABA. For patients on MART, they increase the dose as one inhalation extra. Patients who are on maintenance ICS and SABA reliever, they can quadruple the ICS dose also. And steroids are to be added for severe exacerbations. And once started, you prefer the morning dose of steroids. They've also given a table on which medication to be used in GINA track 1. And so again and again, they just lay emphasis on butacinide, formatrol or beclomethosone and formatrol. They have not given any guidance on other ICS lava combinations. And they clearly mentioned that the data that they have, which have been assessed for MART, has been taken from this combination. So here again, as we did earlier, an inhalation has to be added based on the severity. Number 13, safety issues. They've talked briefly about how pulse oximetry can give us false readings and we should not over depend on that. Uh, we should target a saturation of up to 95% in adults and 98% in children. And for patients with dark skin, uh, be cautious about overestimation of saturation and undermining the severity of the exacerbation. And in safety, they also talk about drug interactions. Specifically, they've spoken about the COVID-19 medication near Maltravir. And they say that there is a significant risk of cardiotoxicity when it's used with ICS Salmetrol and ICS Velantrol because of the LABA component. And so, although it's been advised to stop ICS Formetrol and ICS Velantrol for patients on near Maltravir, you must change it to alternate you must change the ics only or you can change the labas and uh, make sure that the asthma is also controlled similarly with abpa they have clearly mentioned that because itroconazole also interacts with inhaled steroids and it can cause adrenal suppression and cushing syndrome so when you are prescribing cyp a inhibitors you have to be more cautious and make sure you are titrating the dose and specifically with two larvas, salmetrol and vilantrol, um, when these patients are on such medications, 
with interactions you can switch to budesonide and formatrol or you can switch to vomitazone as the ICS. Coming to the last two set of changes, the other changes are in terms of referencing uh, simple small things that have to be taken into consideration. This includes one, imaging in asthma. When we talk about imaging in asthma, the guidelines stress that imaging is not needed in everyone, but it is helpful for patients wherein who have multiple comorbidities and you want to evaluate, or patients with difficult to treat asthma for other diagnosis, and also amongst imaging CT chest and CT sinus plays a important role. Also, they've talked about addition of pertussis as a differential for all ages and not to forget the variable differentials. They have uh, also recommended that we should not use composite asthma control tools and we should not use ACQ 6 and 7, we should be using ACQ 5. Now why not to use composite asthma tools? There are so many risk factors as you can see, so many conditions that can have asthma diagnosis. Uh, so it's very important to ascertain the patient as a whole talking about his control, his symptoms, his exacerbations. So this beautiful table which is given in the guideline talks about how whenever you assess this patient, instead of using a composite score, you would want to see his control and symptoms. You would want to assess the risk factors for the outcomes. You want to see what are the risk factors for exacerbations. And as a whole, cumulatively you want to assess the patient. Also, they've noted that uh, they've given certain advice regarding COVID-19 they, they mentioned that it's very, very important to continue the prescribed medications. Uh, they have discouraged us from using pheno as a guiding tool solely. So they say that we should not be using a single value of pheno as a guiding tool. And uh, they've also talked about other comorbidities of which chronic rhinitis is very important. And uh, the guidelines mention that patients with allergic rhinitis usually have almost 40 percent may have asthma so treatment of chronic allergic rhinitis is important by treating chronic uh, rhinitis based on the guidelines with inhaled corticosteroids we may have less asthma visits but uh, for patients who have rhinitis with polyposis uh, it's been clarified that it may or may not bring about an asthma control but it will definitely bring about reduction in symptoms the other comorbidities to be taken care of are fragility fractures by osteoporosis because of steroids. Uh, we must look at other pharmacological, non-pharmacological strategies and vaccination against influenza is highly recommended though uh, effectively uh, vaccination against pneumococcal has not been shown to have direct impact on asthma but it is also to be recommended in the right group. Uh, the change number 15 is about a future topic. They've stressed that there are many things that need to be updated. We still need to talk about asthma diagnosis in a better way and symptom control. Allergen immunotherapy is something that I really want to watch out for. It may have good implications in future. And COVID-19 and its related changes will happen as and when the disease advances and we know more about its epidemiology. So these are in brief the changes that have been uh, done in the 2023 GINA guidelines. Uh, happy reading. Thank you so much, Dr. Aurora, um, on those 15 key takeaways from the GINA guidelines. As uh, the GINA patient advocate reviewer, and I know several of you serve on that committee as well, as far as um, you know, helping to inform GINA scientific committee on what is most important to patients. I think these are some really important takeaways that we've heard today. Um, number one, the importance of MART in that sits and over age group, right? That That is a very important takeaway from this update. Uh, number two, never ever prescribe Saba alone. And I know that in many of our countries, unfortunately, that's the only way we're managing asthma or the primary way we're managing asthma. And so we have such a great deal of work to still do in that space of not utilizing Saba alone as um, the the go-to for managing asthma. Uh, we also heard OCS as a last resort. In our comments from the, our online community, we heard some concerns around uh, the lack of access to allergy and asthma diagnostics. So whether that be through uh, allergy testing, through the lack of access to spirometry, we know that even though these have been touted in the guidelines for years, that unfortunately, Still to this time, so many patients don't have access to those um, 
reliable diagnostic tools. And then I think one of the things that I would just reinforce is uh, that's coming. And, and I see that Michaela has come in the room. She's been such an integral voice on that GINA um, scientific committee and reinforcing again. So thank you for being here. But the, one of the things that I think is on the horizon um, that was alluded to this year um, is this term mild asthma and perhaps even that term going away. And that would be really something that I think um, would be a significant change to look out for in the next update from the GINA guidelines. We've talked about mild asthma for years. Does it really even exist? And, and the truth is those patients are just as at risk for um, hospitalization and unfortunately for mortality, especially if they're using Saba alone and overusing Saba. So I think that the committee will certainly take this up in an even a more concerted effort. Um, you did see the introduction of the topic of ICS Saba, which again is very specific to where it's available uh, currently, but I think that you'll also see the evidence continue to evolve in the use of ICS Saba combination in the coming updates as well. So a couple of things, I think uh, Dr. Ward did such a nice job on uh, rounding out the 2023 update in GINA, but also a couple of things to look forward to on the horizon. So as we turn to our last uh, presentation of the day, it's Dr. Aurora again, and it's giving us the same sort of quick download on updates and recent changes to the gold guidelines. So I'll turn it to Dr. Aurora now. Hello everyone, welcome to Pulmonology Read Aloud. I'm here with the latest COPD guideline 2023 report. Recently in the last few days, we've all received this report in short PDF formats and a summary of changes. So I'm going to quickly narrate what are exactly these changes? So you can just plug it in. It would be more like a podcast this time because most of these slides are already there for free download online. So let's get started. The new guideline gives a new definition for COPD. It labels COPD as a heterogeneous condition uh, which has chronic respiratory symptoms. What it also does is that it says that abnormality of airway and or the alveoli can occur in COPD and the previous existing terms of persistent progressive airflow obstruction have been retained. This time a lot of emphasis has been laid on the pathogenesis and there have been updates on it. They talk about a term called jetomics for COPD where the interplay of genetics, environmental interactions and the lifetime of the individual determine how the lung is damaged or developed. There is also a new concept called PRISM. PRISM is a concept of diseases which have preserved ratio, the ratio of FE1 on FEC, but other impaired spirometric parameters. This is like a precursor of COPD and airflow obstruction group. They've talked about PRISM because they understand that prevention is really important and screening and catching patients early is very important. So those patients of yours who will have a preserved ratio and don't meet the COPD criteria but have other abnormalities like a reduced FVC or a reduced FEV1 alone will be coming in this category. This group of patients have poorer outcomes in terms of cardiovascular mortality in the reports thus far so it's an important group and it's also an important group in smokers and they have noted that around 40 to 50 percent of these will develop COPD in five years so they would need to be followed up. Last guidelines the term pre-COPD was introduced they have acknowledged that both pre-COPD and PRISM have the risk of having COPD in the future but they need more trials for it and they do recommend that if a patient falls in this criteria, he has symptoms, then you should be treating him. Pre-COPD term has been retained. How it differs from PRISM is because these patients have risk factors, they have symptoms, and they will have either CT abnormalities or lung function changes in the form of affected FEV1 or diffusion capacity, but still the ratio of FEV1 on FVC is more than 70% post-bronchodilation. 
So that makes it's clear that the diagnostic criteria for COPD will remain mandatorily the demonstration of post bronchodilator ratio less than 70%. So this has been emphasized a lot. They have also emphasized that when you're considering the risk factors, then tobacco smoking alone is not the major risk factor now. There is a lot of role of pollution, indoor, outdoor, occupational dust, papers, fumes, and genetic factors also. What has also been done is that a lot of uh, a whole paragraph has been given for chronic bronchitis and they've, they've done that because they realize that a lot of smokers, especially younger ones with more smoking and patients with occupational exposure have a chronic bronchitis type of COPD. The definition remains the same with cough more than three months for two consecutive years, but they've emphasized that people often forget that they have to rule out other conditions that can explain the symptoms before labeling this patient as a chronic bronchitis phenotype of COPD. COPD screening has also been mentioned. They say that if your patient is asymptomatic, has no exposure, no risk factor, there is no role of doing a spirometry camp and screening for COPD in the population. But if your patients have symptoms or risks, you must perform a spirometry. So just like the asthma guidelines, this time the COPD guidelines talk a lot about spirometry. They've also talked about novel screening approaches. They've asked physicians to use a lot of questionnaires and they've also spoken about peak flow measurements for COPD. Now, this is the first time that peak flow readings are being talked about in COPD. We used to use it in asthma for sure, but they have some evidence that these can be used, especially along with questionnaires in COPD patients. They've also proposed a new taxonomy for COPD. So this divides COPD into etiopathogenesis-based types. Uh, it does not have treatment implications yet, but this could be of benefit for the research in future. They've named COPD-G for genetically determined, COPD-D for abnormal lung development related, C for cigarette smoking, COPD-P in biomass and pollution exposure, COPD-I for infections, A with asthma, and COPD of unknown cause. So this definitely opens the realm for looking out for COPD in patients with a heterogeneous group of risk factors. They, uh, there is a strong mention of CT scan or radiology in stable COPD patients, and they've mentioned that not only it helps in differential, it also helps in lung volume reduction surgery planning, and it also helps in screening. So there's a special note that if your COPD patients uh, have COPD because of smoking, you should definitely think about an annual low-dose CT scan if available. If it's non-smoker COPD, then this may not be required routinely. The classification of COPD remains same in the gold grading. So if your patient demonstrates FEV1 on FEC less than 70% post bronchodilator, then based on his FEV1, he'll be divided into gold 1, 2, 3, 4, based on FEV1 80, 50 to 30, 30 to 50, and less than 30 for very severe. Also, same emphasis must be given to MMRC scale as well as the CAT assessment, and this must be included in our evaluation of every COPD patient. This is like the previous guidelines, but they have spoken a lot about seeing the patient not only for spirometric variables, but in totality. And the major change which all of us have actually seen in so many messages propping up is the change from ABCD to ABE classification. They've made the classification rather simpler now and removed the grade C, which had lesser population of COPD patients, and they've clubbed C and D to form a new E. According to the guideline statement, the MMRC and CAT will determine the symptoms. So A and B will depend on whether the symptoms are low or more. But for any patient who has increased exacerbations or increased hospitalization, they will be in group E. And this is more in recognition of the relevance of exacerbations independent of the level of symptoms in a patient. 
They do acknowledge that there is a need to validate this approach with research, but they have mentioned that it may make treatment determination easier for patients. So, for A and B classification, all we need is MMRC and CAT assessment. And for putting a patient in group E, we have to ask whether his exacerbations were more than one a year. This is the initial pharmacological treatment uh, table that has been presented. A, a very simple table now because group A or mild patients will receive a bronchodilator, whether Saba, Laba, Lama. Group B receives both Laba and Lama. And they've mentioned that it's better to give a single inhaler therapy for patients because it improves convenience and it has been proven to help in adherence in various trials. So try to give a single inhaler of Laba and Lama for group B. For group E, Laba Lama stays there. But in case your patient has more exacerbations or he has eosinophilia more than 300, he's the eosinophilic phenotype, then ICS must be added. So then it becomes LABA, LAMA and ICS combination for group E. So the only rule for ICS really according to the guideline in the initial management would be for group E patients. When we initiate ICS, we already know and the previous guideline statement had also emphasized that ICS is favored for in patients with more hospitalization, more exacerbation, or with eosinophilic phenotype of COPD. So this has again be highlighted again. For follow-up pharmacological treatment, the algorithm remains similar, but what is of note is that especially they have talked about checking adherence, inhaler technique, and comorbidities. Just like asthma, they have stressed how important it is for physicians to choose the right inhaler with the patient. Also, before you step up, you have to decide in your mind what is the predominant trait that your patient has. Is he having more exacerbations or is he having more dyspnea? If your patient is not having much more exacerbations, there is no evidence of giving ICS to him. If he's only having dyspnea as his predominant issue and is not responding to lab or lama alone, you add both together. When you add both together, he still doesn't respond. You can switch the molecule. You can switch the device. You can initiate non-pharmacological measures, which have been highlighted a lot in this year's statement. And you can find out the other causes of dyspnea. Only for patients who've had more exacerbations and lava lama is not working, we go to lava lama and ICS. Now this preferentially we will do also if the eosinophilic phenotype is seen and we've done the blood eosinophilic levels. But if the blood eosinophil levels are low, again instead of instituting ICS in um, bronchi chronic bronchitis types, we may consider PD4 inhibitors with lava lama or we can add macrolides. But if the count of the blood eosinophils are high, it gives us more and more emphasis on triple therapy for lava lama ICS. And they've also mentioned clearly that you should also be considering de-escalation of ICS if we see pneumonia because this exists as a potential side effect. For anti-inflammatory agents and the role of azithromycin, they've mentioned that in former smokers it works very well but even if patient is not a former smoker has repeated exacerbations despite therapy you can add azithromycin and consider it for uh, patients with recurrent exacerbations they have discouraged the use of adding lava ics combination in copd only because there is much role of lava lama ics so if you need to add ICS, you preferentially would do it as triple therapy and they've also talked about preferring single inhaler triple therapy for the patients. In other pharmacological treatment, a big no to cough syrups and tetasifs and also caution for using medicines used for pulmonary hypertension in patients with COPD and core pulmonary. This time, the guideline, just like asthma guidelines, have spoken a lot on inhalation device choices, inhalation device principles, inhalation therapy principles. So it's very important to have a shared decision making with the patient and see whether this patient will be able to take this device and then only give that to the patient. 
Also, just like previous years, smoking cessation and pulmonary rehab has been the star of the non-pharmacological measures, but they have categorized it beautifully in tables this time that for group A patients or essentially mild patients, just smoking cessation would do. However, for patients with group B and E, you start pulmonary rehab and there is also a strong role of pulmonary rehab out of center. Vaccination is very important and there are mainly five vaccinations that have been talked about in accordance with CDC. That's the flu vaccination, pneumococcal vaccination, Tdap or pertussis vaccination, COVID-19 vaccination and vaccination for zoster and shingles has been recommended for all your COPD patients. For follow-up of these non-pharmacological measures, they've again talked about looking whether your patient has dyspnea predominantly or exacerbation predominantly. If he has dyspnea predominantly, just like asthma, self-management education, written action plans have been stressed upon and pulmonary rehab and exercise has been talked about. If it's more in terms of repeated exacerbations, then we have to look into the aggravating factors and we have to monitor and manage the symptoms of such patients and also end of life or palliative care support has been given stress now. Vaccinations as we already said are now in recommendation with CDC and so Tdap and shingles will be added. There is a very good table which talks about those evidences that reduce mortality with pharmacotherapy and this is very encouraging because now finally we've started talking about reduction of mortality and not just symptom control. Amongst the pharmacotherapy, only triple therapy has been shown to have a greater effect on mortality. And in non-pharmacological therapy, smoking cessation, pulmonary rehab, oxygen therapy, positive pressure ventilation and even lung volume reduction surgery shows a positive impact on mortality. So this is something that can be considered and a beautiful table for this effect has been given in the guideline. They've, they have summarized the role of not only bronchodilators and anti-inflammatory in therapy and as I've said repeatedly combination therapy has been given more preference Therapy with single inhalers has been given more preference and where ICS is added, Lava Lama ICS has been given more preference. In terms of anti-inflammatory, Roflumilast has a strong evidence in improving lung function and reducing exacerbation in chronic bronchitis. Long-term antibiotics has also been given evidence A. Mucoregulators and antioxidants uh, like NAC have been talked about in patients with exacerbations but with evidence B. And inhaled corticosteroids have now established a well-defined space in the guidelines for patients with group E. Pulmonary rehab, education and integrated programs have also been stressed. So now it talks a lot about rehabilitation of COPD and combination of these two modes of therapy. The next significant change that has been brought about is in defining exacerbations. So the new definition has given a new, the new guideline has given a new definition for exacerbation. The new definition is that an exacerbation is defined as an event which is characterized by increasing dyspnea and or cough and sputum that worsens in less than 14 days. They have also elaborated it that it may be associated with tachypnea or tachycardia and associated with increase in local and systemic inflammation. And they've also enumerated the causes for that like infection, pollution or insult to airway. So a lot of emphasis is being given on etiology of not only COPD but its exacerbations so that people are looking for those things. And whenever they're talking about interventions that reduce the frequency of exacerbations, the differentiation into mild, moderate and severe classification has also undergone a proposal for change. And this proposal is based on a Rome proposal that was published a couple of years ago where there has been a scoring given 
and based on various variables exacerbations can be divided now this is uh, based on post hoc analysis post treatment subgroups but maybe in future we will be seeing better defined variables for mild moderate and severe classifications also they have divided the interventions that you will need for exacerbations so in terms of bronchodilators steroids anti inflammatories anti infectives and made it more streamlined what they have mainly talked about is that since exacerbations are most frequently caused by a group of diseases it's very important before labeling a patient to have had a copd exacerbation to rule out whether it has been because of pulmonary embolism or whether it is because of heart failure whether it is pneumothorax or effusion related or it whether it is a cardiovascular event so such confounders have to be ruled out and then you manage this patient as a copd exacerbation and this has been given a lot of stress in the chapter on exacerbation in this guideline statement they have also summarized the management not only in severe life threatening non life threatening and mechanical ventilation like previous years but these tables have changed and become more refined the discharge criteria and recommendations for follow up have also become defined with tables mentioning what to do in the first 4 weeks of follow up after an exacerbation and what to do up to 4 months of follow up so really a very streamlined approach so that evidence based medicine gets incorporated more and more in our practice in a recent change which is a remarkable change interventional pulmonology has now taken good place in this guideline there are two tables that are specifically dedicated to surgical and bronchoscopic interventions for people with copd they've acknowledged that evidence for this is upcoming and a lot of these things are on experimental basis being done but they have used them and they have defined where and what can be used so for patients with chronic bronchitis they mentioned possibility of nitrogen cryo spray and rheoplasty for patients with exacerbations targeted lung denervation can be done and if your patient has dyspnea with bullas then obviously bullectomy and emphysema then airway stenting endobronchial valves coils thermal vapor ablation lung sealants and lvrsm lung transplant have got a role in the new copd guidelines this beautiful table given in the guideline has divided patients into emphysema predominant patients um where there are no large bullae and they have mentioned how ct scanning can be used and collateral ventilation can be measured by charters and fissural integrity can be checked by hrct and based on presence or absence of these features we can divide whether our patient will benefit with endoscopic lung volume reduction versus lvrs or whether our patients should undergo vapor ablation or endobronchial valve so that has been given a clear emphasis and for patients who are not candidates for bullectomy or lung volume reduction surgeries or lvrs they've talked about lung transplant as an option management of copd thus has become more wholesome and right from initial assessment and the gold abe categorization a lot of emphasis on non pharmacological measures right at the time of initial treatment and management with review and again and again need for checking the skills of patient for self management for exercises for inhaler techniques a wholesome approach has been given in this guideline and it's not just about pharmacotherapy now um much has been advanced in the non pharmacological measures compared to the previous years there's a chapter dedicated on covid-19 and copd but in the crux they mentioned that patients should continue to receive their usual care for copd if they develop covid-19 and the role of NIV HFNC IMV prone positioning anticoagulation remdesivir has also been incorporated in this statement there is a very good checklist a COPD follow up checklist which i feel a lot of us can use in our practice and it has been given um this can help us practice evidence based management and use these guidelines to our benefit thank you very much happy reading 
So this is a brief summary of the changes in the guideline. It does not encompass the whole guideline in detail. And soon we shall have more and more updates in the future. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you. Such a wonderful presentation. Um, you know, when I think about the COPD guidelines and the work that our members, our gut members have been doing in this space, um, I, I would be remiss in not recognizing Nicole Haas and the, the amazing work that her group has done on the empowerment guides. Um, we are in the third version of the updates and, and addition to those guides. And so, you know, a translation of those guides into many different languages that again could not be have been done without uh, the GAP community. I also think about COPD Foundation and their work in the COPD 360 community, their uh, patient powered re registry network and all the great work I think Kristen Willard is joining us online, hates not to be here in person this time. Um, and then I think about some of the publications that we've had at GAP over just the last 12 months uh, in this space of COPD. We've had our COPD patient charter published. We've had uh, the COPD quality standards that we were part, uh, uh, co authors on. And then a publication that is forthcoming here in the next month is uh, relative to, relevant to the hospital discharge discussion that was led here by Dr. Noor. So we actually took that and did a publication on the best practices for a hospital discharge uh, to get the best, most effective outcomes with our COPD patients. So I think that when I think about what is to come in COPD, I believe that COPD is sitting at the brink of where asthma, severe asthma was about five years ago. We now have these seven types, as was outlined by Dr. Nora, Aurora, and um, if you were watching the news that was coming out of ATS last month um, in Washington, D.C., you, you will have seen that the very first biologic for COPD passed its phase three clinical trials primary endpoints. So the day is coming very quickly that we will have biologics targeted to different phenotypes and endotypes of COPD. Some of the most important takeaways that I heard from her uh, were, again, the emphasis on non-smokers. More than 30% of COPD patients have no smoking history, and yet the stigma of this disease, unfortunately, continues to plague. The connection of the non-pharmacological treatments and approaches the smoking cessation, pulmonary rehab, vaccinations, you know, all the good basic care that we know that these patients need to stay well. And then the connection to lung cancer screening. Um, this is something that we've been exploring. Uh, now, in many countries, there is mandatory lung cancer screening for high-risk populations, and yet we don't tell them what it might be if it isn't lung cancer. Right? So is there a way to incorporate these validated questionnaires for asthma and COPD to help people better understand, okay, so it's not lung cancer, great news, not, not lung cancer, but what might it be? And so I think that there's ongoing work here um, in the asthma and COPD guideline updates and in our work with those scientific committees that will continue to evolve and inform um, strategies from a top-down world health perspective and a bottom-up, very local perspective in the work that you're all doing in your organizations. And so, uh, again, I know this has been a very hefty scientific day, our half day of the last four hours. We've covered a breadth and depth of topics um, that I think have really helped me to feel updated and, and um, uh, up to date with the very latest approaches in diagnosis, treatment, management of all of these conditions. And um, we are going to stop here with our scientific meeting after I do a few thank yous. So first of all, we could not have held the meeting today and had all of you in the room, plus all of those online, the wonderful AV team without the support of our industry sponsors. So I want to give a huge shout out to AstraZeneca and Roche for their support of the scientific meeting. 
Uh, secondly, nothing like this happens by just one person. And so without the team of Lindsay DeSantis as the executive director and Victor Gascal Marino, the team at GAP, the AV team, again, that has just done a phenomenal job today, um, this would not have gone off with all the efforts. And then finally, I want to thank all of you, because without you coming around the table and really, again, day in, day out, bearing the load of answering the phone calls, responding to the emails, walking hand in hand with so many patients through their lived experience, through their journey, um, really, it, it wouldn't give GAP the platform and the opportunity that we have. Uh, to represent you at a global level. And so definitely thank all of you for making the effort uh, to be here and to join in with us today. I'll just pause, make sure we don't have any last minute questions, comments, no? Just thank you. Ah, thank you, thank you. Thank you. It's been uh, just a joy to be with you all today. We are going to enter into our annual general assembly, annual general members meeting at 5.30 here local time. Um, if you've not registered, please do so. You can scan that QR code. It is open only to members of GAP. So you must be an active member. And each organization that is an active member has only a single vote as we go through the order of business uh, for the AGM. So with that, if you'll just keep those few things in mind and we will break. We do have, I think, more refreshments and things outside. And then we'll reconvene just before to get started promptly at 5.30. We anticipate the AGM should not last more than an hour. Okay, thank you. Thank you.